Uh, I think we're missing one, but we're, we're going to kick this thing off, folks. Uh, let me give you a brief recap from last week, okay? Uh, last week, we started talking about some basic real estate concepts, and so we got into things where we introduced some verbiage. And so let's just start with like the first big word that I threw at you, an appurtenance. What is an appurtenance? Isn't it the process of a piece of personal property becoming a... Oh, wait, no, 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 no. Sorry, I studied a bunch and I got... Yeah, don't get it, don't, yeah, you gotta be careful. An appurtenance is something that um, uh, goes with the property. We there you go. An appurtenance is just a fancy piece of terminology that says something runs with the land, okay? There are a lot, a lot, a lot of different things that are considered uh, appurtenances. And so we even started talking about some. Your water rights, your air rights, your subsurface rights, your bundle of legal rights, all these things are considered appurtenances. And so appurtenances are not necessarily good or bad, but they are, in fact, something that runs with the land. That's kind of the generalization. Now, I did introduce another word uh, that is typically on a pertinence, but it's something that puts some type of limitation on the use of the property. What was that word? Was it encumbrance or encumbrance? Encumbrance. There you go. An encumbrance is some type of limitation on the property, uh, and we're going to talk about some more uh, different types of encumbrances today, but I think the example we used was Dora's subdivision said that her fence had to match her neighbor's fences, and Dora was upset because Dora is unique and wanted her own fence, and so what that did is that created a limitation on the property. So that is a type of encumbrance. It is a limitation. So we're going to look at several different ones, and we moved into uh, some discussions about uh, water rights and subsurface rights. Subsurface rights, meaning mineral, oil, and gas rights, can be severed, meaning you could retain them when you sell the property. You could sell them off separately and keep the property, but then lose your rights to these subsurface elements. Uh, and then we talked about a couple of things that go hand in hand with that, uh, right of lateral support and right of subjacent support. Subjacent meaning if somebody's mining your property, they can't do anything that would mess up the structural integrity of the rest of your property. And then right of lateral support is your neighboring uh, properties can't do anything that would mess up the integrity of your property. So then we talked about things like water rights. Remember, water rights are non-severable. The broad category of water rights that we break it into first is what? What are the two main categories of water rights? Navigable and non-navigable. Not quite yet. That's one of the subcategories. Is it riparian and littoral? There you go. There you go. Riparian and littoral are the broad categories. Remember, riparian is ponds, streams, rivers, uh, things that do not have a affected by ocean tide, okay? And then littoral is your oceans, your intercoastal waterways, you know, things of that nature. Now, this is where I told you to be careful, and it should never come down to this on the test. Lakes can fall under littoral, especially the Great Lakes that are connected to, you know, uh, estuaries and water basins and things of that nature, because some lakes do have, like, sand on that border, some do have a tide. It, they'll never, they're not going to try to trick you on the test, so depending on where you take some practice questions, you could see lakes reference on either, but typically you focus on the oceans and the intercoastals and stuff for littoral. And so remember the ownership uniqueness, okay? When we're de dealing with littoral rights, oceans and you know things of that nature, you own up to where? What did we say you own up to in littoral rights? Up to the edge of the high tide watermark. You're right, up to the average high tide mark. We call that the mean high tide. Mean, if you don't remember from grade school, is just a fancy word for saying average. Okay, so the mean high tide mark or average high tide mark uh, would be where your ownership was. And so when it's low tide, everything between that average high tide and low tide is, belongs to the public. We call that area the foreshore, right? The foreshore. And then, then we get into riparian, okay? The ones that deal with rivers and streams and ponds and things of that nature. And then those have those subcategories of navigable versus non-navigable. Oceans are always navigable, right? But some streams, right? Not navigable versus rivers that are. And so the way that you think about it is if it is a non-navigable body of water under riparian, you own into the water. 
The way that you're going to see this more often than not on the test is it's going to say something about a non-navigable creek running between two property lines. And it's going to ask where each person owns and they're going to own halfway into this creek. Okay, they do own the soil underneath the creek and by default the creek as well. So that's where you actually do own the water. You own the water, the land underneath the water and these non-navigable riparian rights. In the navigable bodies, it's just like the highway. You may live along it, but you don't own the highway. And so riparian rights that are navigable bodies of water, rivers, um, you only own up to the water's edge. You do not own into the water at all. And then we went on and we started talking about some other really important terminology. We started talking about fixtures. Fixtures are a type of an appurtenance. And so remember, a fixture, well, you tell me, what's a fixture? Personal property converts to real property by attachment. There you go. It's where you take something that was personal property, like a fan from Home Depot, and you drove it to your house and you attached it to your house. And now it becomes part of the real property because it is affixed to the house. And so that is exactly where we left off having this conversation about personal property versus fixtures. And so I told you, you got to get your minds right. Okay. You got to understand that there is a default setting to everything. If it's a fixture, what happens to it by default when we're dealing with a real estate transaction? Uh, by default, it, it is transferred with the real property unless other speci otherwise specified in the contract. There you go. If it is a fixture, by default, it is staying for the new owner, okay? The ceiling fan that's up there, when the new owner, when the buyer buys it, now legally owns it, it's now their ceiling fan, okay? If we're dealing with personal property, like the Maserati in the garage, what is the default, the default setting for that Maserati? It's going to go with the current owner. There you go. It's going to go with the seller, right? The person who is currently owns it, who is selling the property. And so we all understand that there is a default setting. If it's personal property, it leaves with the seller. If it's real property, it stays for the buyer. And the only time we need to talk about these things on the contract is if we want them to do what? Be different than what is... The opposite of what they are intended to do, right? That's exactly right. The only time I would need to talk about a fixture on the contract is because I was giving the seller permission to take it, which is not the norm. The only time we would need to talk about personal property on the contract is if we were asking the seller to leave it for the buyer, which is not the norm. This is very important on the test because sometimes they're just going to give you a very black and white scenario and you've got to know what will happen. Right? What is the default if no other information is given? But then other times we will give you additional information that will change things. And that's where I told you, you've got to understand the default and you've got to be able to understand the flow of events to make something different than the default. Because the one most important thing to understand about real estate is that everything is negotiable. I have negotiated patio furniture, lawn mowers, chainsaws, bar stools. I mean, you name it, we can negotiate it. So... Very important to understand the default. Now, we had some conversations about this list you currently see on your screen. This list is pulled from a specific North Carolina document. Okay, so Jacob asked a question last week about differentiating. I'm going to be very specific when I say this is North Carolina. This is national. This list is North Carolina. For national, the default for your brains is nailed, screwed, glued, or buried. It's a fixture. In the real world, it's more complicated than that. Everybody okay with our little recap? Cool. So let me introduce some more vocab, okay? And we'll just, we'll call it vocab because that's really what it is. I mean, this stuff is very testable, but there's not gonna be a crazy amount of questions. And so when we're talking about different types of fixtures, there are some that have specific names. Well. If I said in general, nailed, screwed, glued, or buried, I want you to think about what's outside your house right now or you know wherever you live, if it was being sold. There's azalea bushes, there's oak trees, there's rose bushes, there's all kinds of plants, aren't there? And so nailed, screwed, glued, or buried. When we're dealing with plants, there's two special categories. There is what we call fructus naturalis, which translates to fruits of the soil. 
And those are the things that are considered real property. Those azalea bushes, those rose bushes, those oak trees. And so in other words, if you go and you buy a house and it's got an oak tree in the yard, it's a fixture, it's called Fructus Naturalis, and it's staying for you. Can you imagine buying a house and getting there and somebody dug up all the rose bushes from the flower bed? It, it happens. It does happen. Yeah, it does. Uh, and it's a hot mess express when we don't clarify, but that's not supposed to happen. So things that do not require harvesting. Now we're not talking about annuals versus perennials. I'm just saying if it's not a crop that you utilize for an industrial purpose, then it's, it's part of the house. It's part of the real property. Could we negotiate if somebody wanted to take their blueberry bush or their, you know, prize winning roses or whatever? Sure we could, but if we don't negotiate it, fructus naturalis are considered real property. They stay. The opposite of that is what we call fructus industrialis. Notice that word. It fruits of industry, things that you make money with, crops. And so your corn crops, your cotton, your potatoes, your you know, soybean, whatever it may be. Now this goes even to the extent that they are a tenant. So I told you last week, I've got a property in Georgia, and I like to use it as an example for a lot of these early concepts, okay? I have 80 acres, 20 acres of it is farmland. Now folks, I look like a lumberjack, but I don't necessarily look like a farmer. I don't even own a pair of overalls, you know what I'm saying? And so the point I'm trying to make here is I rent that farmland out to somebody else. Well, every single time I go to my property in Georgia, there's a different crop. Sometimes it's uh, cotton, sometimes it's soybeans, sometimes it's onions, and it's my farmland. But even though it's my farmland, folks, I can't just go out there and help myself to those different items because that is the farmer that I rent it to. That's his personal property. Even if I was to look him in the face right now and say, you're not allowed to farm my land anymore. I can't do anything to hurt his crops because that's his personal property. Even though I say, nope, no more, I would have to allow him to come back and get them. Okay, you see the differentiation there. Crops, also called fructus industrialis, also called implements, are, called, are considered personal property. Whereas your other stuff that you don't harvest, that's considered real property. And it conveys to the house. Everybody good with that? So, as you might imagine, I showed you North Carolina has a list, and that list is very helpful, but folks, as big as that list was, do you think that it outlines everything that could ever come into question, ever? No. And so, the question that uh, y'all asked last week, and I think maybe it was Manoj that asked it, and it was a really good question, who's responsible for making sure that these things are negotiated? And the answer is the real estate professional. We have to have an understanding of what is and what isn't a fixture, and if, if it's, folks, when in doubt, spell it out. I will teach you this in post-licensing, too. We can never assume anything in real estate, because that's going to get us in trouble. And so, there's a very important concept that comes into play in this discussion. It is called the total circumstance test. Okay, the total circumstance test. Now, I need you to understand something because if you don't, this will throw you off on your test. This is, and I'm about to switch the slides here, it is a legal test. What does that mean, a legal test? Can you repeat that? Yeah, we're about to talk about something called the total circumstance test, and I haven't explained it to you yet, but it, I, all I'm telling you is it is a legal test. What do you think that means that when I say it's a legal test? That it'll hold up in court? That it'll hold up in court, but even more specifically, only the courts can do it. Hmm. There you go. It, you're right, Missy. It has everything to do with court. So here's the thing. If we're dealing with the total circumstance test in real estate, you ready for this? It means you done messed up, A.A. Ron, okay? It means you didn't clarify something that you should have. 
You should have negotiated that this stayed or didn't stay on the contract, but you didn't do it. And so now what do we have? We have a buyer and a seller who are both pissed off. One saying they were allowed to take it. The other saying, no, you weren't. And you know who gets to decide is Judge Judy. So the total circumstance test is a test applied by a court of law to determine who is right and who is wrong. In other words, was it a fixture or was it not? And so the acronym for the total circumstance test is IRMA, I-R-M-A. These are the only four criteria they look at to determine who was right and who was wrong. In other words, was it a fixture or was it not? Okay. IRMA. And so the I stands for, and, and remember what I told you, we had those two words, annexation and severance. Annexation is when you attach personal property and make it real property. Severance is severing it from uh, the real property, making it personal property again. So when I say I, it stands for intent of the annexor, the person who attached it. Okay, intent of the annexor. Did they intend for it to remain permanently? That's the first question they answer. The next thing is R. What was the relationship of the annexor, meaning the person who attached it? So were they the owner of the property or were they a tenant? Folks, think about it. If you are renting a house right now and you go out and you buy a $700 fan that'll sing you to sleep and play you know, video games in your ceiling fan, do you probably intend to leave that $700 ceiling fan when you leave your, your lease? Probably not. An owner probably intended for it to stay. A tenant probably didn't. So that's the question. Was it attached by an owner or a tenant? M stands for method of attachment. How permanent was it? This is that nailed screwed glued thing again. If it's held in by 72 lag bolts, it's probably considered pretty permanent. If it's just hanging on a wall, it's probably not. And the last one is adaptation. In other words, adaptation of the real estate. Uh, how weird would it be to remove this? And so let me give you an example. I used to have it in my slides and I took it out because it, you know, just we went off on too many tangents. But I used to have a picture where somebody had a refrigerator recessed back into a wall. But then there was another picture where it showed that what they basically had done is they cut a hole in their wall put a pedestal out in their garage. And so the back of their refrigerator was pushed out into their garage. They had just cut this janky hole that went out into their garage. It was terrible. Now folks, if you remove that, you've got a giant hole that goes to the garage. And so it would be really hard to remove that and allow somebody to remove it and just leave that giant hole. So these are the criteria. There's nothing else. Intent of the person who attached it, the relationship of the person who attached it, the method of attachment, in other words, how permanent, and the adaptation of the real estate. How customized is it to that piece of real estate? And so understand that size, location, and value have no standing in this consideration. So if I bought a $20,000 freaking chandelier number one somebody slapped me uh, but if i bought a twenty thousand dollar chandelier and hung it up in my house and i forgot to exclude it and i want to argue in court that i should get to keep it i'm going to lose doesn't matter that it's twenty thousand dollars size value location mean nothing this is what they look at this is not something we as real estate agents do we as real estate agents just clarify you want to take that chandelier with you okay let's make sure we put it as an exclusion in the contract and if we do that job right, then Irma never comes into play. But Irma is testable on a national point of view. <clears throat> so, got a couple other pieces of vocabulary that kind of come hand in hand with this conversation, all right? Now, before I introduce this next piece, which is going to throw you a little bit for a loop, I'm going to remind you about a couple pieces of verbiage we, we learned last week. The first one is chattel. What is chattel? Personal property. Personal property. That's exactly right. Chattel, personality, 
personal property. That is synonym toast crunch, folks. They all mean the exact same thing, okay? Chattel, personal property, personal tea. The way I told you to remember chattel is movable personal property, right? Because it sounds like cattle. Now here's the deal. I'm going to introduce something now called a trade fixture. When you hear trade, think business. You know, like learning a trade, like as, as an HVAC technician or something like that. Now a trade fixture, I want you to think about this, is also called a chattel fixture. Does anybody have a problem with that statement? You should. I do. Why, Kirsten? Because if you say trade, I'm going to think about like the AC, uh -huh. right? You have to have a professional come and work on the AC, likely remove it. But if it's chattel, it means it's movable personal property. Uh -huh. so that there's a conflict there. Yeah, and, and so we don't even need to talk about the trade piece of it. You can, you're dead on. Folks, if I say chattel, which is movable personal property, and then I say fixture, which is not personal property, that is what we call an oxymoron, folks. It is two things in the same sentence that completely contradict each other. If you're not familiar with an oxymoron, jumbo shrimp is an oxymoron. Icy hot is an oxymoron, okay? Chattel fixture is an oxymoron because what we're saying is movable personal property fixture? Doesn't make sense, does it? It kind of does because you're not taking into account the other part. It says that it's a trade um, trade fixture, right? Which basically just means that it's personal property even though it's a fixture because it's excluded because of what it's used for. That's a little bit of a stretch, Jacob, because it still doesn't... I mean, you, if you've read ahead, I mean, you, you understand it, but you see what I'm saying? If you just say trade fixture, you know, it just says fixture. And this is where if you take things literally, it will screw you over on the test because the, here's the visual. Trade fixture is what they're going to call it on a test. And if you just read fixture, most of you will say, oh, it's, it's a fixture, it has to stay. But this is a unique category of fixture. And so it is also called a chattel fixture. You may or may not see that term on the test, but you better remember it means the same thing. Because if you remember that it's called a chattel fixture, it will help you remember that it is not considered real property. And so a trade fixture is where you have things that you attach, like hood vents, prep tables, kitchens, salon equipment, to a place of business in order to do your work but they remain personal property, and so you can take them with you when your lease ends. Okay, you can remove them and take them with you. Now, if you were to abandon them, the landlord could gain them by way of what's called accession, right? You just basically abandon them, and then they adopt them because you abandon them. But trade fixtures or anything that you install, even maybe semi-permanently or permanently, to a place of business to do your work. And you are allowed to take them with you when you go. Now, this is where I said this is where your brain needs to default. If we say something about a trade fixture on the test, you better know the tenant can take it with them. But, of course, the landlord and the tenant could agree that they were going to leave it. There, we can agree to the opposite always. There's just has to be a default. So if we say nothing else and we say, well, what's going to happen at the end of the lease for a trade fixture? It's going to leave with the tenant. They are allowed to take it. It is still their personal property. Everybody okay with that statement? Now here's one that goes a different direction. In North Carolina, for this next one, okay, this is nationally recognized, this trade fixture concept. But North Carolina recognizes a very specific thing called an agricultural fixture. An agricultural fixture. So an agricultural fixture is where, let's go back to that piece of farmland. My farmland's in Georgia, but let's say it was in North Carolina. If that tenant was growing corn on my fields, it's his personal property. Remember that fructus industrialis, those implements. But if he said, Seth, I'm going to install a grain silo to store the corn, 
That is automatically my grain silo because he built it on my property. Okay, on agricultural fixtures, when somebody builds something on land that they may be leasing as a farmer, and it automatically becomes a fixture for the property owner. It becomes my property. If he puts up a permanent fence, it's my fence. If he puts up a grain silo, it's my grain silo. If he puts up a barn, it's my barn. Now, folks, do not overthink this, okay? Because what would probably happen in the real world if he came and said, I'm going to install a grain silo, I probably would give him a hell of a discount for the farmland because it's improving the value of my property because I know that I'm going to, to, to gain it. Don't ever get so caught up on these fictitious people, right? Sometimes I teach this and people are like, oh, I feel bad for that poor farmer. Folks, this isn't even a real person. I'm just teaching you a concept. You're really like, well, that doesn't seem fair. Why is he going to keep his grain silo? It's fictitious. So we can negotiate anything. We could negotiate that they could take it down. We could negotiate that I'd give them free rent in exchange for that grain silo. But if we don't give you any additional information, anything that is attached to a piece of farmland, whether it be attached by a tenant or not, becomes real property. What you got, Justin? You just answered my question. Man, I'm good like that, aren't I? Tell you what. So, trade fixture, personal property. Agricultural fixture, real property. This is all verbiage stuff, folks. This is level one. You just got to know what the heck it is. What you got, Josh? Um, so, why, why, I guess, like, because that seems like a really fine line to cross between trade fixture and agricultural fixture. Um, I'm guessing trade fixture is... Uh, you're able to take with you because it's not it's it's not attached to that to the physical property, but it's not attached to the land at all. Um, it's more because of the nature of the two different commercial businesses. You know, I mean, when we're dealing with commercial buildings and upfitting, you know, people remove stuff. I mean. Personally, I know developers who have turned restaurants into office buildings. And so for the nature of commercial, I mean, we, we remove stuff and add stuff and remove stuff and add stuff all the time. But when we're talking about giant grain silos and things for farmland, I, I really couldn't tell you why. Uh, I guess they just consider the nature of it was a little bit more um, long term versus the, the you know, hustle and bustle of the, the change of commercial. And... You know, at the end of the day, who knows? You just got to be careful for it on the test, right? Is there any, Does it have any? Sorry, go ahead, man. Is there anything in particular like how there was the, the fixture sheet that you gave us last class? Is there anything on here that we would uh, consider an agricultural fixture, but it may technically not be? No. And so yet again, for test purposes, if I say, you know, uh, Josh was renting 30 acres of farmland from Sandeep and Josh installed a barn on the property, you know, what is the status in North Carolina of that barn? You would just say it's Sandeep's barn. That's, that's all it comes down to. If we're dealing with anything agricultural, farmland, anything like that, it automatically becomes real property, even though you are a tenant that, in, that attached it, and that's just how you have to answer it. But if it has nothing to do with agricultural, if it has nothing to do with the farm, and it's for you know a hair salon, a restaurant, a bowling alley, or anything like that, and you install XYZ, you can take it with you when you go. Yeah. So, isn't that also, I mean, kind of how it's attached, right? Because if we're talking about agricultural fixtures, those are all like construction, right? I mean, when we're thinking about it, right? A silo is a piece of construction built into the land. Whereas like a hair salon, one of those sinks, it's built inside of uh, a structure that's already there, right? It's, it's, it's very different in that sense. Sure. And, and, but at the end of the day, folks, what it really comes down to is because they said so. And you're just going to have to see, there's going to be a lot of concepts I'm going to teach you tonight and it's going to make your brains hurt. And you're going to, you're going to want to split hairs and I'm going to have to just look at you and I'm going to say, stop it. Because it is what it is because they said so, right? You just have to know what it is for the test. You, you know, people who are not us decided this a long time ago and that's just what we go with. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Samantha has a 
is a fantastic question. Will you answer that? Yeah. Uh, what about the cows, chickens, livestock? Does that belong? No, no, no. That's that's very much just like the implements, the corn, right? That's that's the tenant farmers. You know, that's personal property. You know, don't tell the cows that they're personal property because it might hurt their feelings. But they are personal property. Okay, they they belong to the tenant farmer. Uh, livestock and crops fall kind of in the same category. Yeah. Good question. Is it the same terminology? Is it still called? No, you wouldn't call it implements. implements? No, you just call it personal property. It's their cow, their sheep, their, yeah. Because it's not attached, right? Yeah, and, and because it's not a crop. Implements, you remember fructus industrialis is what implements are. It's it's fruit of the the so, uh, of, of industry. So it's just at that point, you just call it personal property cow. It's a personal property cow. That's what it is. No. Yeah, like I said, this, folks, honestly, we're, we're about to get into, like, the way more, like, heavy stuff uh, in just a moment. And so don't let this, you know, eat away at you. It's just, know the verbiage. If you see agricultural fixture, it's a fixture. If you see a trade fixture, it's personal property. It just comes down to verbiage, okay? Just being able to recall this. Let me throw one more into the mix here um, that's a little confusing. And it's not crazy testable, but you could see it from a North Carolina point of view. We have what we call the North Carolina UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, folks, if you, the easiest way for me to articulate this is if you think of places like Aaron's or Rena Center, where you can go and you can basically get on a payment plan to like rent to own something. And they've got everything under the sun, right? TVs and dishwashers and, uh, you know, washing machines and recliners and refrigerators. And so basically what this comes down to is if there's something that exists in a house that under normal circumstances would be considered a fixture, but there is a creditor who has a claim against it by way of some type of security agreement, then it remains personal property until it's paid off. And so I told you in North Carolina, a dishwasher would be considered a fixture. Well, if you got that dishwasher from Rena Center and you still owed 20 payments on it and it wasn't paid off, technically we can't consider it real property. It's still considered personal property. And so what this comes down to in the real world, we would need to have a discussion before closing about how we're going to handle this. More often than not, it's pay it off at closing so there's no longer a credit agreement so it can convert to real property. But that's all you need to know. If it's not paid off and there's a security agreement against it, it could still be considered personal property. The more common example, kind of what uh, Kirsten was going into earlier, uh, an AC unit. A lot of people are financing AC units nowadays because they're so expensive, you know, $7,000 or whatever. And so if you still have uh, payments due on the AC unit, well, we need to pay it off at closing. Otherwise, this creditor would have a claim. And so when the old seller leaves, or if they stop making payments, these people could come knocking on the door and be like, nope, we got to take the AC unit out. Homeboy, stop paying. Yeah, that's a bad day. So... Uniform Commercial Code basically just says things that would normally be considered real property are still considered personal property if there's a credit agreement against them. So let me add a little more uh, in-depth conversation to a word I have already introduced. Folks, what does the word improvement mean? Anything that you add to a piece of real property that increases the value. There you go. That's it. Uh, anything that you add to a piece of property that increases the value. Houses are improvements. Fences are improvements. Sidewalks are improvements. Septic tanks are improvements. All of these things are considered improvements. Now, there is a dis distinguishing factor between what we call improvements to the land versus improvements on the land. Improvements to the land are public in nature. Improvements on the land 
are private in nature. So your house, your fence, your things like that, those are improvements on the land. Improvements to the land may be attaching sewer lines or putting sidewalks along them or grading them to make them easier to develop or something like that, okay? Improvements to the land versus improvements on the land. But an improvement is just anything that adds value to the property, you know, adding these buildings, adding the, you know, infrastructure, adding whatever. And so improvements are appurtenances. When we're conveying this piece of real estate with this land on it, then it was going to be conveying there too, or there with, however you want to say it. <coughs> the septic, the sewer, the house, all these improvements are appurtenances. So here's where we get into some more specific things that I know will be testable for sure, okay? Folks, what is a manufactured home? One that still has wheels or, um, I don't know what it's called, underneath it. <laughs> Got some wheels on it. Home. Mobile home. Mobile home. So, so what? What I understand it to be is personal property because you have to register it with the DMV. Register it with the DMV. Okay. Yeah, we're all on to something. What were we saying, Josh? Um, that is is manufactured. Manufactured. Yeah. Yeah. If folks, you are all right. Okay. Now, let me let me make sure that you understand something. M mobile, manufactured, trailer. Those all mean the same thing. Okay, not necessarily the, the most politically correct terminologies anymore, but a manufactured home, a mobile home, a trailer, those are all the exact same. But do not lump modular into that, okay? Modular is something completely different. So you've got to be able to understand the difference from a testable point of view of manufactured versus modular. Now, here's the reason why this is so important. As Misty and some of y'all mentioned, a Mobile home, also called a trailer, also called a manufactured home, is a home that is built in a factory and it is installed on a steel chassis. And it also has wheels, axles, and a hitch. It can be tugged behind a truck. And so you can remove the wheels, the axles, and the hitch, but you cannot ever remove this steel chassis. It is part of the support. It is part of the structure. Here's why this is important. Because of the way that it's constructed, as Misty mentioned, a manufactured home is considered personal property. It has a VIN number just like your car. You pay personal property taxes just like your car. Now, important to note that it can be converted to real property if certain criteria are met, but let me explain why this could be a really bad day for us as real estate agents, just to put things in perspective. I already told you that in North Carolina specifically, a refrigerator is considered what? Personal property. Personal property. So can you imagine being a real estate agent and you negotiate a deal and you're a little bit of a silly goose and you forgot to ask for the refrigerator that your clients really wanted. And so when you get there on the day of closing, the refrigerator is gone. That's a bad day, isn't it? You're going to be buying a refrigerator. You're going to be buying a refrigerator. Now, I want you to picture what happens if you're a dingleberry and you forgot to specifically name that the manufactured home that is also personal property is going to convey and you get there on the day of closing and the entire freaking house is gone. You see why this is important to understand what real property and personal property is. Because it's one thing to screw up a refrigerator. It's a whole nother thing to screw up a house. So when we're looking at the test, a mobile home, also called a manufactured home, also called a trailer, is personal property. And it will remain personal property until certain things have been been met certain criteria 
cost. The way that you convert it to real property is you take that mobile home that you own and you install it on a permanent foundation on land that you also own. You remove the wheels, the axle, and the hitch, and you do what's called an affidavit of conversion with the DMV, where you say, I'm no longer treating this as personal property, I'm treating this as real property, and I will be paying real property taxes on it. If all those criteria have been met, it is now considered real property. What are those steps one more time? So you have to go to the DMV and do and register. Bam, right there. Place on a permanent foundation on land you also own. Remove the wheels, axles, and hitch. And then file an affidavit of conversion is what it's called, where you notify the DMV that you are converting it to real property and no longer wish for it to be considered personal property. Now, there's another important note here that you could see that's testable. All right. These manufactured homes are built to what we call HUD minimum construction standards. HUD is short for the Department of Housing and Urban Development, all right? That's where the word HUD comes from, Department of Housing and Urban Development. This is the reason why they tell you that you do not want to be a manufa in a manufactured home when a hurricane or a tornado comes through. They're not built as sturdy as a site-built or stick-built home. And so because of an exemption to the rules, they do not have to meet state or local building codes. They only have to meet these minimum construction standards imposed on them by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So manufactured homes start as personal property, only have to meet HUD minimum construction standards of safety, but can be converted to become real property under the right circumstances. Those circumstances are attaching on a permanent foundation on land that you also own, removing the wheels, the axle, and the hitch, and filing an affidavit of conversion with the Department of Motor Vehicles. So here's that insight into the building codes. Okay, they're exempt from meeting the local and state building codes. So I told you the other big one that comes into discussion here that you've got to make sure you keep it right because a lot of people group them together, but the other one is called modular. Modular is different than what we were just talking about, okay? A modular home is a home that is built in pieces offsite at a factory. Now, some modulars are what we call on-frame, some are what we call off-frame. On-frame means they typically do have some steel bars underneath as well, uh, but they're not ever with wheels, axles, or hitches. It's just an additional support piece. So don't ever let that confuse you. So modular is built in sections offsite, and then it is carted to the site where it's going to be installed. Now, here's the big, big, big difference. Modular is never considered personal property. It's just separate building blocks, if you will. And as soon as it's attached to a permanent foundation, it's automatically considered real property. Okay, it doesn't have to go through any other special criteria. This is intended to become real property as soon as it's on, attached on site on this foundation. It also does have to meet these state and local building codes. It is not exempt. So we're going to talk more about building codes when we get into the public land use control section. But uh, it would have to meet any and other building codes, uh, like any what we call a site-built or stick-built home is the terminology, meaning one that was built completely on site. It has to meet the same building codes. So considered real property from the word go. As soon as it's attached on that foundation, it has to meet the building codes, whereas manufacturer does not. Everybody okay with that differentiation? <clears throat> so, 
Now that we've kind of gotten some of this basic concepts under our belt, we're about to switch gears and you're about to get your first dose of, God, this sucks. Okay, there's just no other, there's no better way for me to articulate it, okay? It's just, we're about to get into the concepts, which you're just not, you're not gonna like them. Okay, they're gonna bother you. And, and so here's the thing that you have to understand, all right? It, the concept that I'm about to teach you, it's not a hard concept, it's not. You're just not gonna like it because you have probably never heard this terminology in your life that I'm about to teach you. And that's what makes it difficult. Because as I'm teaching it to you, you're hearing it for the first time. And if I just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, this makes good sense. But when I first introduce it, you're not gonna like it. Um, do understand that it is testable, but there's not a crazy amount of questions. And don't let it hurt your feelings, all right? You're not going to like it. Everybody okay with that warning before we move into this? I right, know. I'm sorry. Let me just get this last slide. Oh, yeah, you're good. So here's where we kind of switch gears. We've been talking about this differentiation between real property and personal property. We've been talking about appurtenances. We've been talking about, you know, all these basic understandings. Now we're going to kind of start taking all of these to another level. All right. And so let me start with a, a terminology that you need to know. And it's a word you've heard before, but it's, I'm going to have to give you a little more insight into what this word actually means. The word is estate. Okay. Estate. Of course you've heard that word, an estate sale, real estate. Okay, you've heard this term. But when we're talking about this class, you need to think of the word estate as what level of relationship or legal interest does somebody have with a piece of property? Okay, that's what the word estate means. What is your legal relationship to a piece of property? Or in other words, what is your legal interest in a piece of property? Um, Jacob says, is this a new unit? This is kind of bleeding into like the section two area of the syllabus. Uh, so this is not no longer basics. This is property ownerships and interest section. But it kind of just goes hand in hand with the conversations, but it is technically a different section. So a state just means legal relationship. Well, folks, can we all agree that if you own a piece of property, you have a relationship to it or you have an interest in it. You agree? Can we all agree that if you're renting a piece of property, you have a relationship to it? Sure. Now I asked you last week, is if you're renting, do you own it? And the answer is no. You have rights when you're renting property, right? Remember when we talked about the bundle of legal rights, the deep sea? When you are a tenant, your relationship to that property is you have temporarily purchased the right of exclusion, the right of enjoyment, and uh, the right of possession. And so that's exactly how we break up these estates, okay? These estates. Estates of ownership, and estates not of ownership. We call the estates of ownership freehold estates. We call the estates not of ownership non-freehold estates. And we also call them leasehold estates. Okay, it's in the name. If you are leasing something, you have a non-freehold estate, also called a leasehold estates. There are a leasehold estate. If you own something, you have a freehold estate. Uh, Jacob, yeah, it should be three, I believe. I'll look at it in just a second and confirm, but I think that's right. <clears throat> so here's where 
we're going to go down some rabbit holes and I'm going to introduce things you've never heard of in your life. Now, I want you to understand something, okay? Listen to me. Do any of you in here own a Lamborghini? I, I know, Adriana, that's such a silly question, right? Why would this man ask us if we own a Lamborghini? As a method to my madness. Folks, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say none of you own a Lamborghini. Why? Why don't you own one? Cost. They're too expensive for most of us in here. I agree. Everybody okay with that? This is not, we're not shaming anybody. Lamborghinis are ungodly expensive. You all agree? Yeah, I was going to say it wouldn't make it down my dirt path. Well, it, well <laughs> just one of the many reasons. I'm sure you don't own one, Misty, right? Here's the reason why I asked that question. So, say what, Josh? It's a depreciating asset. It is a depreciating asset. But let's be honest, for most of us, it's because we, we couldn't even fathom paying that kind of money for a car. And so here's what I need you to understand before I start talking about this question or this section. Folks, just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. There are plenty of people who own Lamborghinis and we will never understand it because we will never have that kind of money. So when I teach you this section, you're going to be like, I don't understand why this exists because people richer than you needed it to exist. Does that make sense for everybody? You've got to separate yourself from just because it doesn't make sense for you does not mean it doesn't make sense. You'll see what I mean in just a second. Hey, you know, I'm rooting for you, Jacob. You know, my, uh, my seven-year-old keeps telling me he's going to be a YouTuber and that he's going to buy a cyber truck and a Lamborghini and a, a Ventador and all these. And I'm like, good for you, buddy. I hope so. So then I can retire, right? I'm hoping my son does that. So let me give you a long visual here, okay? This, this has a lot of information. Don't panic. Okay, I'm going to just talk you through this and then I'm going to give you some slides to back this up. Now, just listen first and then, of course, take notes after. Because what I find is sometimes if people are so focused on taking notes when I'm saying this that you're not actually understanding what I'm telling you. Okay, so I told you estates is just what level of ownership, interest, relationship that you have with a piece of property. And so we can break that into two broad categories, these freehold versus non-freehold. Now notice how I don't have anything coming off the non-freehold, also called leasehold. We'll talk about that later. I want to focus on the freehold now. Freehold is ownership. I own it. Okay? I own it. Well, when we get into ownership, there are more than just the straightforward types of ownership that we think about. And so yet again, there are reasons these things exist. It just may not be pertinent to us. So let's start on the left side. Right here, this is how most of us own property. If you own a house right now and you look on your deed, it will say that you own your home most likely fee simple. So fee simple, also known as, here's one of those synonyms, right? Fee simple absolute. If you are dealing with the test and it says fee simple or fee simple absolute, they mean the same thing. Okay, let's group these together. Now, of course, there's subcategories. So this is what we like to call in the real estate class the highest and best form of ownership. Okay, highest and best form of ownership. Now, I asked you last week if you could do anything you wanted with your property right now. And what did you tell me? You told me no, right, Justin? It depends. Depends. <laughs> depends is always such a great answer. But, Justin, why can't you do whatever you want with your property? Because I have an HOA. Because you have an HOA. We call that private land use controls. The other reason y'all told me last week is because the government controls. Yeah, there you go. Because the government controls part of it. So folks, understand that when I say fee simple absolute, it is the highest and best form of ownership. You can do whatever you want with your property 
within the scope of public and private land use controls. Just because you own it fee simple absolute does not mean you can do everything, but it does mean that your ownership is uh, is pretty up there, okay? You can do just about anything you own as long as it doesn't violate your public and private land use controls. This is gonna make more sense as we go along. So most of us own our properties as fee simple absolute. Now, here's where I've got to throw in something that you're going to like, you, you know, like when you like talk to a dog and the dog gets a little confused and they do this thing right here, they go, Burr. this is where I got to introduce a concept and every single one of you are going to do that. You're going to go, Burr. right? And then I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it make sense. This side is ownership. It's called fee simple to feasible. It is a type of fee simple and it's got another name for it. But here's what you have to understand about fee simple to feasible. It is an ownership type that is so unique that you could end up not owning the property anymore. There are rules imposed upon it that if you don't follow them, it's not your property anymore. And I want you to think about this word. What does this word sound like? Defeasible. I like a reduction. Mm, reduction. Like defeated. 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 Folks, this is ownership, but it's ownership where you could defeat your ownership. If you don't follow the rules, you could defeat your ownership and you don't own it anymore. That is a very unique type of ownership. So this is also what we call qualified fee. And so yet again, think about the root word, right? To qualify. You have to qualify for your ownership or your ownership could be defeated. You will absolutely see both those terminologies on the test. Qualified fee, fee simple to feasible, they're the same thing. So they, they are estates of ownership. You do own it. But if you do not follow a set of rules, you could not own it anymore. You could lose that ownership. Seems like a weird concept already, right? You're like, well, why don't anybody want that? And just wait. Gets weirder. Seth. Yeah. Can you please give me an example of fee simple, the feasible? <sighs> no, Misty, that? I just want you to use your imagination, and I'm never going to explain anything in any way, shape, and form about it. Of course, I'm going to give you an example. Hang tight. I'm going to give you lots of examples. So. When we're dealing with fee simple to feasible, also called qualified fee, there are two subcategories, okay? Fee simple determinable and fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. It's a mouthful. Sometimes they just shorten it by one word to fee simple subject to a condition, but the, the full legal terminology is fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Okay, so these are two different categories of defeasible, also called qualified fee. And these are all types where if you don't follow a set of rules, you're not going to own it anymore. Now, Misty so kindly asked for an example, and I'm going to be happy to give you one. However, I'm going to let you take a break before I hurt your brains anymore. Work your way back. Get your cameras back on so we can explain some of these fun-filled estates concepts for you. Lots of fun-filled things to learn tonight. <clears throat> so, as you get back, we're talking about estates. Remember, estates, I said, just means some type of ownership or interest in a property. Okay, and we're focusing on the left side, okay? We're freehold estates, which are estates of ownership. And then more specifically, we're going down the fee simple side of things. Now, there's a couple different ways that these can be broken apart and categorized, and I'll get into that more in just a second. But what we're talking about right now, okay? When I said fee simple absolute, highest and best form of ownership, there are no restrictions other than public and private land use controls. And even then, you have to understand that public and private land use controls are not a strong enough restriction to ever cause you to lose your ownership of a property.
But looking at this side, okay, this fee simple defeasible, also called what? What was the other name for it? Fee simple absolute. Nope. Conditional subsequent. Nope. Was it qualified? Fee? Qualified fee. Qualified fee. Now, this is why one really, folks, this is why this section is so difficult. Um, number one, you've never heard these terms before. Number two, they all kind of sound similar, right? I mean, if you look defeasible and determinable, one is a subcategory of the other, but they sound so similar. So it's just, this is really going to be like make flashcards and quiz yourself on this crap because it's just, it's very easy to get lost in these terminologies. Okay. So fee simple defeasible, also called qualified fee is ownership, but it is ownership where we have restricted your use of the property. There are these restrictions put on it, and these restrictions are so powerful, if you don't follow the rules, you could lose your ownership. Now, let me give you some examples. You have to understand the two different categories, though. When we're dealing with fee simple determinable, we have determined the allowable use for your ownership. So if I say, uh, I'm giving my property to Monica and Monica can use it so long as she only ever utilizes it as a horse farm. I have determined the one allowable use. Monica is the owner, but Monica can only do what I told her she can do. Use it as a horse farm. Does that make sense for everybody? Now, we're going to get into some concepts in a minute about property going back to somebody, okay? When, when you mess up and it goes back to where it started, that is called to revert or reversionary interest, okay? So let's say that I gave Monica a piece of property. I said, Monica, you own this so long as you only ever use it as a horse farm. Well, you would say Monica owns it fee simple determinable so long as she only uses it as a horse, horse farm. But if Monica breaks the rules, one morning she decides she's going to use it as a, I don't know, a wedding menu. She doesn't own it anymore. And so it actually is automatic reversion. I now legally own it again. I don't got to go to court or anything. The way that the law is written for this, it just automatically reverts back to me. The second she stopped using it for the one allowable use, it reverted back to me. I'm the owner again. Now, if I'm dead, it would be my heirs or assigns is what we call it, right? Whoever my next of kin is. So that is fee simple determinable. We've given you one allowable use. Do that or you automatically lose it. The other one, fee simple subject to a condition or fee simple subject to a condition subsequent is the full mouthy, lengthy version of it. It's basically say, do whatever you want as long as you don't do this one thing. So I give Tim my property. Tim, you own this so long as you never sell alcohol on the property. So if Tim has a horse farm, he's cool. A hog farm, he's cool. As long as he, a church, he's cool. You know, a wedding venue would be fine too, but he can't sell alcohol on premises. Now, when he breaks the thing that he's not allowed to do, the interesting note is this one does not have automatic reversion. I would have to go by way of a court proceeding to get my ownership back, but I would get it back. So no bootlegging, huh? No bootlegging. It's out, man, unless you're just really good at hiding it, you know? Now, this is where I told you, just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. Picture being a billionaire philanthropist. And when you die, you want to leave 700 acres to a facility or an organization that you love. You're going to put rules on it. They can own this so long as they only do this. They can own this so long as they never do this. doesn't make sense for you because you're not Bruce Wayne. But if you were, this would make a lot more sense. What you got, Josh? Oh, you're unmuted. I just, I thought maybe you're about to ask something. Oh. No, you're good. Now, let me give you an example of this. Now, folks, I, I promise there's going to be slides that accompany this, but I have, I, I feel when I teach it this way and I just kind of walk you through it and you can just really hear what I'm saying, you have a tendency to better grasp this. So have any of you ever heard of Dorothea Dix? 
Monica, you have? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, most of us are in the Triangle area, and so you've heard of Dorothea Dix. And so if you're not familiar um, where it started, the Dix family was a very prominent family in North Carolina, and they were very wealthy. And they left this property that is now Dorothea Dix uh, and Dix Park, as they call it, to the city of Raleigh. Now, here's what you may or may not know. They left it as a mental health institution, Dorothea Dix Hospital. And it really wasn't a fantastic hospital in any way, shape, and form, but it did exist, and it was gifted to the city of Raleigh. Now, folks, Dorothea Dix was gifted by the Dix family to the city of Raleigh, fee simple, determinable. It was there so long as they only ever used it as a mental health institution. Now, I'm going to teach you about another concept down the road, but I'm going to give you a mini lesson on it here. There is this concept called a cheat. Okay, a cheat. E S C H E A T. If you die without a will and you have no next of kin up to a certain level to give that land to or anything that you had, the state will take it. And they say, okay, it's mine now. Because there's nobody to give it to. They will go through this line. It's called the law of intestate succession. So they'll go through this line of people. And if you have no one to give it to, they say, okay, yoink, it's mine. It's called a cheat. Now we're going to talk more about that later. So here's the perfect example of this. The city of Raleigh was gifted the Dorothea Dix institution by the Dix family. Fee simple determinable. So long as they only ever use it as a mental health institution. And so the city of Raleigh was sitting there one time and I'm just kind of, I'm embellishing a little bit because I don't know how the meeting actually went down, but the people who have these conversations were sitting there and they say, oh God, doesn't it suck that this property is worth like $3.8 billion and we can only use it as a mediocre mental health institution? And they're like, yeah, man, it really blows. But hey, you know, it was fee simple determinable. You know, if, if we stop doing it as a mental health uh, hospital, it will go back to the Dix family, this automatic reversion, okay? It'll go back to the Dix family. Somebody's like, oh yeah, that really sucks. And then somebody's like, well, you know, there's, there's none of them left. And I said, none? And they're like, no. And they mean like none? And they're like, no. North Carolina is completely Dixless. Ain't no Dix left in North Carolina, okay? All the Dix is dead. Okay, ain't no dicks, no more dicks, D-I-X, nobody get weird, okay? No more dicks in North Carolina, they're all dead. And so here's where the, North, the, the city of Raleigh came to the conclusion. Here's what they figured out, folks, you ready for this? I said, oh, so what you're saying is, if we stop using it, it'll go back to the Dicks family. But there are no Dicks family. And so here's what they did. They said, oops, we stopped using it as a mental health hospital, went back to the Dix family. Oops, there are no members left of the Dix family. And so the state of North Carolina just gained it by way of a cheat. Oops, we just turned around as the state of North Carolina owning it fee simple absolute and we sold it back to the city of Raleigh after we gave them the grant money to buy it back from us. And now they can do whatever they want with it and the Dix family is rolling in their graves. That's where I used to work at the at the big building for the state. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But, is, but see, now you can't say that with a straight face now that I said we, we, the, the whole thing, right? Dicks, this ain't no more dicks. All the dicks is dead. Um, that big hospital was creepy. Yeah, I, that's what I've heard, that it was not a fantastic facility. It was a little uh, creepy in every way, shape, and form. <clears throat> so let me circle back around to the question that Sam asked, okay? And this is where, you know, I've got to remind you, Sam says, well, why does it automatically revert to the owner in determinable, but not automatically revert to the owner in subject to a condition? Um, the, the main answer is because I said so. I mean, like that's really the main answer. And, but the, the better answer is, I'm sure it has to do with giving you time to correct it, right? When there's only one use, it's very obvious that you just blatantly ignore the rules. If we said you can do whatever you want, but this one thing, it typically gives the person the opportunity to correct it before they lose that ownership because it was a little more subjective. That's why. So like if I go to court because, you know, Tim was selling alcohol, Tim's going to be like, I'm, I'm sorry, I completely forgot. I'll stop selling alcohol. And then potentially Tim could keep it. That's why. Just because there's a little more gray area because we said you do whatever you want but this one thing. So understand 
that every single one of these is in a state of ownership, okay? When I gave Monica the horse farm and said you can only use it as a horse farm, that's fee simple determinable. But Monica does own it. When I gave Tim the property and said do whatever you want so long as you don't sell alcohol. Well, he can do whatever he wants as long as he doesn't sell alcohol, but Tim does own it, okay? These are estates of ownership. And so one of the things that really comes into play here, one of the most testable things for whatever reason for these is, well, are they an estate of inheritance or not? What do I, what do I mean by an estate of inheritance? Passed down from generation to generation. Uh, passed down from generation to generation. Yeah, what, what else are you going to say? So it means it can be willed to somebody, right? You can leave it to them. Now, I want you to understand that every single one of these that I just mentioned, all these fee simple subsidiaries, these are always estates of inheritance. They can be willed to somebody. So Monica and her fee simple determinable horse farm that I gave her. If Monica put in her will that upon her death, she wanted to, Monica, do you have kids? How many? You just, you just hold up. Just one, two, two, two. There you go. Two. <coughs> if Monica put in her will that she wanted this horse farm to go to her kids when she died, she can leave it to her kids. But I want you to understand, when we're dealing with things like this, you can never give more than what you had. So what would her kids have to use this property for? A horse farm. A horse farm. And if her kids didn't use it as a horse farm and they changed the use, what would happen to it? Go back to the original. It'd go back to the grand tour, right? There's that word that we introduced last week, which is me. Or if I'm dead, my kids. Is this making sense? Yeah. So by the same token, Tim has this property that I gave him and he can do whatever he wants as long as he doesn't sell alcohol. And Tim hates his kids, right? They're rotten little turd buckets. And so Tim says, I'm going to leave my property to Corey, because he's my friend. And so when Tim dies, he leaves it in his will to Corey. And so Corey can absolutely inherit it. And Corey can do whatever he wants with this property, except what? Use it for alcohol. Selling alcohol. There you go. Is this making sense? It's not as scary as it's sometimes made out to be, folks. You just got to kind of walk through it and understand. Now, every single thing on this side of these fees... Fee always means inheritable. If you ever see fee, it can be willed. Now, unfortunately, that's not super helpful because the ones that are not inheritable, very seldom do they actually call them non-fee on the test. But if they were non-fee, then they would not be of inheritance. Um, but fee means inheritance, okay? Fee can be willed. What you got, Sandeep? Uh, so my question is, uh, once you restrict something on the land, can you go back and change it later down the road? Um, it can be changed, but only the person who restricted it can change it. So okay. could I change it and say, oh yeah, Monica, you can do whatever you want. I changed my mind. Sure, I could. If I, could I, I could do that to Tim. Monica can't change it. Tim can't change it. But I can because I'm the one who put that restriction on there. That was the stipulation that, that was put on there when they were granted ownership. I see. Yep. After somebody is granted ownership. Sorry. I was just going to say after somebody is granted ownership, um, and we're talking about how the grantee can go back and you know say, you know, never mind, you can do whatever you want with it. The grantor. You know, op, or, sorry, grant, grantor. Um, could they go back and do kind of... Not, not the opposite, but could they, could they add a restriction after it's already given? No. No, because I don't own it anymore, right? If I gave this, this horse property to Monica, Monica is the owner. Now, understand, Monica could put additional restrictions as the owner. She just can't do anything that would uh, contradict mine. So could she then go and put another restriction that says, well, it can only be for Clydesdales? She could, because that still meets my criteria, but I can't go back and change anything. Um, now, understand yet again that there are defaults for all of this. And so could you have a legal document that gives somebody the right to change it in an end time? Sure. If you hire an attorney and have them draft up some beautiful language, but without anything to the contrary, this is how this works. Uh, what were you saying, Stephanie? 
I was going to ask, like, if um, Monica, say, um, faulted on it and you had passed away and it went to your kids, could your kids change it or it would still have to be the same? Nope, my kids could change it because it went back to the original grantor, so, uh, or the grantor's heirs. They would have the right to change it. Okay. Yep. Because presumably when I owned it, I owned it fee simple absolute. But when I gave it to Monica, I said, Monica, you only own it this way. So when it comes back to me, it's still fee simple absolute, which is what happened with the Dix family, right? The Dix family owned it fee simple absolute. They put this restriction on the city of Raleigh. So when they stopped using it and it went back to the Dix estate that doesn't exist anymore, it went back as absolute. And so when the government stole it back, they stole it back as fee simple absolute. This is why, you know, that's why attorneys make the big bucks because they write this crap that's supposed to be foolproof and then some other fool shows just how foolproof it was, you know, it's just ridiculous. So, yeah. So all of these are estates of inheritance. Um, yep, that's exactly right, Monica. It did, it, it, it's, cheat back to, it, it's cheated back to the, the state. And so because there was nobody left, the state of North Carolina got it by way of its cheat. And so if you don't know this, the state actually, when it uh, uh, acquires property by its cheat, it sells it at auction. And that money is supposed to go to public schools, just like the lottery system. However, this was a predetermined deal that the city of Raleigh got to buy it back. And then the state of North Carolina actually granted the city of Raleigh the money because it was, they were, whew, it was, it was something else. Good luck Googling it. That was, it was not necessarily something that they were proud of, but uh, it was a little, yeah, yeah. It did happen. And now they have pretty sunflowers over And there. now they have pretty sunflowers. That's right. But, you know, screw the people with mental health issues, okay? Go look at the sunflowers if you're feeling bad, all right? I don't care that you got voices. Go look at the sunflowers, you know? I'll make it better. What you got, Josh? For these um, types of ownerships, who would be responsible for the taxes? The owner. Monica. Tim. They own it. Understand that word ownership is ownership. They do own it. It's just I've restricted what they can do with it, but they own it. Remember, that's the whole point of freehold. These are all estates of ownership. Yeah, good question. Until the grantor passes away or accepts. No, 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 no. They'll own it forever. So understand, folks, in theory, Monica and Monica's heirs could own that horse farm for the next millennium, okay? They could. She could leave it to her kids, her kids could leave it to their kids, and they will continue to pay taxes and they will continue to own it. Now, let me ask you a question here. Monica owns that horse farm that she can only ever use as a horse farm. Can she sell it? Uh, yes. Yes, she can, but she has to keep the horse farm thing. There you go. She can sell it, but it's going to be advertised as if you buy this, it can only be legally ever used as a horse farm. So whoever owns it is the owner. But it's just that these rules are so powerful that you could lose your ownership. Right. And so, and then it, will, it could revert back to the original grantor. Yeah. Right? It could go down 500 levels, right? It could be sold 500 times, willed 500 times, and if the 500 person screws it up, it would still come back to me and my uh, heirs and assigns as the original grantor of this this rule. And and then if it was if there was a situation such as the the Dixon's family where there's no one alive within that lineage, it would just go back to the state the state lost. Potentially, yeah. I mean, if there was nobody left in the law, it's called the law of intestate succession. We're going to get into that to a minute. Dying without a will, they basically write one for you. And if they can't find anybody on that list, then they just take it by way of a cheat. That's exactly right. Oh. Yeah. And then they say sucks to suck, Chuck. Yeah. Excellent question. Let's be honest, Josh. You just wanted to say Dixes, didn't you? That's all you wanted. We just wrote back around. He's like, I just want to say the Dixes. There's no more Dixes. Yeah, it's okay. Me too. I just not know <laughs> Um, Monica says transfer yeah, by way of a deed. This is all transferred by way of a deed, uh, showing that transfer of title. And this would all be outlined on the deed. So when you see it, right, like Monica's deed would say, you know, Seth Chauncey as grantor and Monica, uh, Sandoval as grantee. Um, and you know, a fee simple determinable ownership where she only could ever use it as a horse farm as outlined on exhibit a, it would all be outlined right there on that deed. And it would name that it would go back to, uh, revert back to me if she ever, you know, stopped using it as that all outlined on the deed. Okay. But every, every single thing on this side 
is ownership. And understand, folks, that when we are limiting these ownerships, there's only two things we can limit for ownership. There is your use of the property, and there is the time that you will own the property. So I'm going to skip forward for a second. I'm going to come back to this, this grid here. If you think about it, all I did in fee simple determinable and fee simple subject to conditions subsequent, which are both types of fee simple defeasible, or also called qualified fee, is I limited your use. But as I said, Monica could own it for another millennium or her family or her descendants could. I'm not limiting how long she owns it, just what she can do with it. So when we're dealing with ownership, the only things we can limit is your time that you own it or what you can do with it. That's it. So... Here's where I'm going to go ahead and give you the other kind of lecture because I promise as so many times as I taught this, if I just kind of walk you through it, when you see it revisited on the slides, it really starts to click some more. And I'll come back to this slide as well. And remember that I just gave you the copy of these so you can have these slides. So don't panic about the note taking thing. Um, if you miss is something. A, is there a place or is there like a term that we can Google where we can get the whole diagram that has... Like even the other parts to it, like this one. Yeah, but it has like uh, absolute. Where well, has absolute, but conventional, legal, homestead, dower. No, unfortunately, there's not really fantastic. I mean, I I had to kind of move this one around and create this one to the extent yeah. that I wanted it. There's not a lot of really fantastic like charts because some, once again, some textbooks group them together in different ways, some than others do. So like, you know, this one is not grouped by estates of inheritance. This one is grouped by uh, freehold versus non-freehold and then kind of some subcategories. So there's different resources out there, but I don't know that you'd find one exactly like what you're looking for. Stephen, I'm sorry, you may have said this and I missed it, but is this national or is this... Any national. This is all very much national. Very, very testable on the national side. Yep. So let's go to the other side of freehold, okay? Remember, freehold is ownership. And so now when we travel this line over here, we've got what we call a life estate. This is another very abstract concept. And so a life estate is, yet again, ownership. But we are limiting the time that you own it. And so the two main categories that you need to know, of course, uh, you know, as, as Josh just mentioned, there was, uh, there's a couple other ones in there that come into play, like legal life estates, which are, you know, synonyms with conventional. But the main terminology that you need to know is a conventional life estate and what we call a life estate per ultra V. Okay. Per ultra V translates to for the life of another. So let's start with the conventional life estate. A conventional life estate is where you give property to somebody so long as they are alive. So I say, uh, Eliza, you own this property so long as you are alive. I'm not telling her what she can and can't do with it. I'm just telling her how long she's going to own it. Now, she is an owner, but she's not an owner indefinitely. She owns it for, you ready for this? Exactly for the life of one Eliza. When she kicks the bucket, it's not hers anymore. That is called a conventional life estate. In life estates, you've got two things you have to understand. Who the owner is and who is the, what we call, measuring life. In a conventional life estate, they're the same person. Eliza is the owner, and Eliza is the measuring life. She owns it so long as she is alive. And so when she dies, she does not own it anymore. And because of that... Go ahead, Jacob. Okay, I, I want to ask a question that kind of connects some things. So when you own real property... Right? Well, I guess first off, it, are estates and real property still considered like this, like the same? 
like or, or is an estate not real property um remember a state is just what legal interest in in something somebody has and so if we're talking about an estate sale it's just trying to work out all your legal ownership interest your property ownership and di divvying it divvying it out so these st estates are different types of actual ownership right like they were all talking about right now and so they'd be on a deed okay so <clears throat> with that being said some of the in, in the bundle of rights that you get, right, you have the right to sell your house, right? You have the right to sell your property. That's one of the rights. Um, if you're in this situation, right, it, it, I think you said Eliza was the example. If she has this property until she dies, but she owns this property uh -huh. because we're still under freehold, so she still owns it. Does she still have her full bundle of rights, right? But can she sell this? And if so, then when she dies, does the other person just lose ownership? Mm -hmm. Not to pick on you, Jacob, but if you'd let me finish the thought, you'd, you'd have all these answers. You're asking good questions, but that's okay. the whole point of being the teacher and teaching you things, right? You got to give me a chance to teach it before I can answer it, right? Or, I mean, I can answer it now, but you're going to get there, okay? I'm gonna, all will be revealed, I promise. So, in this example, Eliza is the owner, and she owns it until Eliza dies. Okay? That is a conventional life estate. So, she is the measuring life, and she is a life, life tenant. Now, this is where I have to warn you, folks. It gets a little morbid in class, because I'm for the next couple sections, I have to kill people a lot. Not literally, but figuratively to help you understand concepts, okay? And so... We do not know how long Eliza is going to live, but we do know that it's hers so long as she is alive. Now, you have to understand that when she owns a piece of property and she only owns it until she dies, the big question is, well, what happens when she dies? We're not going to just like make this a free for all where like everybody gets to go and like fight over this piece of property. That wouldn't make any sense. So there's one of two things that happens with the ownership whenever this life tenant passes away. It would either revert back to the grantor. Remember, I just used that terminology, right? Reversionary. It would go back to the person who gave it to you. Or we could name a third party that it would go to. That person is called a remainder man. Not to be sexist. It's called a remainder man. And so I could say, Eliza, you own this property so long as you are alive. But when you die, it will go to Jacob. And so Jacob would be the remainder man. Eliza is the life tenant. And this, folks, is why this is not and never can be an estate of inheritance. Because if Eliza has a will that says, I'm leaving this property to my kids, as morbid as it sounds, the second she stops breathing, it's not hers anymore. And wills don't kick in until you die. So that is what a probate is, right? Probate is where you look at somebody's wishes and you say, can we even uphold this? So if Eliza's will said, I want to leave this property to Justin, probate's going to say, no, she can't do that. It's not hers anymore. The second she died, it became Jacob's property because Jacob was named as a remainder man. Misty, you whew, you get excited about those questions, girl. What you got? Okay, so who named Jacob the remainder man? Who did that? Me. The grantor? Yeah, the grantor. Or the grantor. The okay. grantor, yeah. That's it. Folks, none of this stuff ever would happen by accident. You would have to have an attorney draft up some very specific legal documentation that outlines this. In theory, if you had a piece of property and you wanted to name who was going to own it for the next 10,000 years, you could. It'd be a lot of writing. You'd have to pay an attorney a lot of money because what are they going to say? The firstborn child of this person. If not this person, then that person. If not this person, then that person. And then it goes to this person. And it goes to this person. If you wrote it out thorough enough, you could basically articulate what you wanted to have in a piece of property for the next 10,000 years plus. Now, why would we care? Why would we do that? We wouldn't. But you could. What you got, Adriana? So, um, if I have a property and I want... Uh, to give it to my mom while she's alive. And then 
I can name another person to use the property after she dies, right? So could you did you say it cannot be a family member from the from my mom? Or no, I I there I didn't say anything about a restriction. It can be whoever the hell you want it to be. Oh, okay. I I I thought that it, you could not um well, since well You can't not, will it if you own it this way. Okay. But if you were the owner and you're creating the conventional life estate, you can name whoever you want as a remainder man. You can okay. name whoever you want as the owner. Okay, and next question. Who is responsible for the taxes of the property again? It Same answer as before. The owner. The grantor. No, the grantee, the owner. Okay. Folks, yeah, that's what you have to understand. These are all ownership. Why would anybody other than the owner pay the taxes? Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. For sure. Excellent question. Uh, what you got, Jacob? Nothing. Are you good? So... Let me take this a few steps further, okay? Let me give you the name that we utilize. And please understand, there are slides that are gonna show you all this stuff. I just like to have a conversation because people get really scared of this section. In the conventional life estate, the names that we use, for the owner, we call them the life tenant. Do not let that freak you out. They are the owner, but we call them a life tenant because they will not own it forever much like a tenant will not be leasing a property forever. So they are the owner, but we call them a life tenant. And then the other person is called the measuring life. And so in a conventional life estate, the life tenant and the measuring life are the same person. Now, Jacob, you did ask a fantastic question a moment ago, and here's where I'm gonna answer it. Or better yet, I'm gonna have y'all answer it. I said, Eliza owns this property so long as Eliza is alive. Okay, and let's say it's, you know, a 20 acre parcel that I gave her. Do you think Eliza can sell this 20 acre piece of property? It makes sense that no, she couldn't. I'm going to use the word again. She's an owner. Yes. What, so. what stops an owner from selling? But let's think about this. What you got, Dora? Oh, I can only see your forehead, Dora. Not even your forehead. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I'm like, I think Dora's there. She unmuted, but I was just okay. saying your pretty hair. I didn't even see you. Oh, thank you, thank you. I would say no because of the type of. Because of yeah. how unique it is, right? Yeah. Is that what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's... <clears throat> so here's the deal folks Eliza owns it she owns it for exactly the life of one Eliza and she turns around and she puts a sign after she gets it she puts a sign in the yard and she puts it for sale and Kingsley comes along and he sees this for sale sign and he picks up the phone and he calls Eliza he says I'm interested in buying this property well folks here's the kicker Eliza can sell it and Kingsley can buy it. However, when, King yeah. when Kingsley looks her in the face and says, well, Eliza, this is a great piece of property and this is a great price. Um, uh, you, you own this fee simple absolute? And Eliza's going to say, oh, no, I, uh, uh, I have a conventional life estate. And Kingsley's going to say, I'm like, uh, a what? I didn't hear you. Speak up. She's going to say, uh, conventional life estate? And Kingsley's going to say, well, ha, hold up. Wait a second. Before I buy this property, I got some questions. Number one, Eliza, do you smoke or drink? When was the last time you went skydiving? How healthy are you? How much are you charging? Because folks understand that if Kingsley buys this, Kingsley will own it for exactly the life of one Eliza. You can't give more than you have. Eliza was only slated to own it for her life. If Kingsley was to buy it from Eliza, Kingsley would only own it so long as Eliza is alive. So picture this, Kingsley gives her money and gets the ownership, and the next day Eliza gets hit by a bus. Kingsley owned it for half a day. And it sucks to suck, Chuck. 
<laughs> so you can sell it, but you won't own it forever. Think here's the other thing that people get confused on. You can borrow money against it. But yet again, if you call the bank and you say, oh yeah, it's a conventional life estate, they're gonna ask the same questions. Well, how much is it worth? Do you smoke? Do you drink? How healthy are you? When was the last time you went skydiving? And they're like, okay, yeah, we'll lend you $500 on it. Because they're not taking a big risk on something that you don't actually own forever. Because you, that's it. That's all we're limiting is your time. But I'm still following along here. I haven't freaked you out too much. You look like you had a thought, Josh. Uh, I did. Um, I was trying to figure out, I guess, how uh, is this practice relatively much today? And, or is this something that we kind of see more with um, homes that were built pre prior to like the lead-based paint law? So this is none of these are commonplace. Well, the fee symbol absolute is commonplace. All these unique ones are not commonplace, but they do have a, a, a time and a place. Let me circle back around, folks. Let me, let me help you out here. You don't understand it all yet, but I, I, I'll use Adriana's example. What if you had a family member who, you know, was elderly or you wanted to look after them or something? And, and so you just wanted to make it super simple that, you know, they own something so long as they're alive. And then when they died, it would go elsewhere. I'll give you a, a really good example of this when I teach you another concept. I, I can't quite get there yet because you don't know the full picture, but there are times and places where you might use this. It's typically special circumstances, right? Family members, things of that nature. Let me just give you a real easy one. If, if my brother had a son who was disabled, okay? And my brother was not doing as financially well as I was, and I wanted to help him out because my nephew, you know, needed extra care. I could do something like grant him a, uh, a life estate. Now, I'm not gonna grant it to my brother because it's not my brother that I'm trying to help out. It's my brother because this my nephew would be disabled, right? And so that's where this other one comes into place. This one, called a life estate per ultra V, is the life tenant and the measuring life are different people. So I could say to my brother, well, hey, I'm going to give you this piece of property and you own it so long as my nephew is alive. Because maybe he's not, you know, he has some terminal illness, he's not slated to live as long, and I just don't want my brother to have to worry about it so long as this person, you know, is alive. And so this would be a circumstance that you may consider doing this. And so I'll give you a couple examples as we get further into this, but a life estate per ultra V, remember I told you, translates to for the life of another. And so the life tenant is one person. The measuring life is somebody else. In this case, the life tenant's my brother. He's the owner of the property. Who's the measuring life? My nephew. If my nephew passes away, my brother no longer owns the property because that was the measuring life. Now, this is very important. Notice how on my slides I've got, well, this is sometimes inheritable. Well, think about it. What if my brother dies and my nephew is still alive? Legally, I've said my brother gets to own it so long as this person's alive. This person's alive, my brother's just dead. Told you this conversation gets more, but I have to kill a lot of people in this section. So he could will it to somebody because it's still his to own. Now think about it. Let's say that this brother wills that property to his son, my nephew. Now what do we have? You have a property that may go um, intestate because the, the son probably won't be. Born. Well, not intestate. Intestate, intestate. No, not that either. So I would guess you have a life estate for the life of another. Is it a conventional life estate? It's changed from a life estate per ultra V to a conventional life estate because my brother was a life tenant, my nephew was a measuring life, that's a life estate per ultra V. When my brother died and willed it to his son, he is now the measuring life and the life tenant. So now he has a conventional life estate. 
He will continue to own it so long as he is alive. See how that works? What happens when he dies? I told you, with a life estate, you either have a reversionary interest or you have a remainder interest. So we have either stipulated that it will go to a third party named a remainder man, or it will either revert back to the grantor. Now, the, the default is reverting back. If we don't name a remainder man and we don't say reversion, it's automatic reversion. So let's say I'm the one who gave it to him, and I didn't say who it goes to after. Once he dies, I get it back. That's what we call a reversionary interest. Yep. What you got, Jacob? Yep. Sorry, my AirPod died like right as you called on me. No worries. Um, uh, uh, okay, so if, right, so say person A gives it to his brother er, for however long his disabled son is alive, um, his, I mean, right, but the, the two parties, the two initial parties are, are older, um, so, so say, you know, they die, right? Brother dies, um, and the the grant the grantor and the grantee both die, and um, now it's just left for um, the disabled son, right? He passes away. At which point, um, since it's not inheritable at this point because now it's a conventional life estate, when he dies, it then goes um, to the state. If there's not a third party, no, they would ha they there's they, they would have to be not eight parties. Um, so when we we're gonna get into this more in depth in a second. When you uh, let's just use your example, I gave it to my brother as a life estate for Ultra V. My brother died. He willed it to his son and became a conventional life estate. I'm also dead. When this kid dies, if we have not stipulated who it's supposed to go to, it would go back to my estate. And then they would look down seven degrees, okay? They would look for my uh, uh, spouse, if I had one. If I didn't have a spouse, they'd look at my kids. If I didn't have kids, they'd look at my parents. If I didn't have parents, they'd look at my uh, siblings. If I didn't have siblings, they'd look at my cousins. If I didn't have cousins, they'd look at my second cousin. And then it stops there. So it, they would basically look through all of those people for my relatives under the law of intestate succession is what it's called. And if there's nobody within that those categories, and this is state specific, by the way, um, like you're not going to be tested on the categories of the law of intestate succession. You just have to know that it's a thing in each state and it would have to go through the process. And if they can't find anybody, then the government would take it by way of a cheat or the state would. Gotcha. I just didn't know if, you know, uh, like your your family, your descendants, if that was something that they would look at or not. So thanks for yeah, saying that. Yeah, for sure. Yep, it would go through that process. So I think I've kind of given you everything in a nutshell on this, right? Like this, there, I'm going to get some more in-depth conversations, but it's not as scary as it sounds, okay? It's really not. It's just new information and it's abstract information. So this is just, you got to just keep replaying it and replaying it and replaying it. But do understand that there are not a crazy amount of questions on this. Is this exceptionally testable? Yes. Is there a lot of questions on this? No, not in any way, shape and form, like four or five. But they're all going to be about, can it be willed? Can it be inherited? Can it be this? Can it be that? And so I'm going to move forward here because I do have slides for these individual things. I just wanted to give you kind of the general walkthrough of this flow chart here. So as I already showed you, you can limit how long somebody owns it, time, or you could limit their use of it. And the way that these limitations happen, I've already introduced these words, but I'm going to bring them back in. And those words are grantor and grantee, okay? We've got this person giving, right? The or is the give or the E is the receive E. And when we're giving somebody this ownership, they can give them all of the rights. They can give them part of the rights. They can give them, you know, limited. They can give it. You know, there's a lot of different options. As the owner, you get to decide what you give, what you retain under most circumstances, depending on if anybody's already done that to you. So... 
when we're going through this, okay, I've already kind of started talking about deeds. Now, here's what you have to understand. There is no such thing as the deed to a piece of real estate. There's not just one. There's thousands. Every single time ownership changes, there is a new deed. And so the most recent one shows the grantor and the grantee, and the grantee is presumed to be the current owner. The one before that should show where this person, who was named the grantor on that deed, was named the grantee on the previous deed. And it goes back and back and back. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. So there are multiple deeds, and every single grantor on the current deed should link as the grantee on the previous deed. We call that chain of title which we're going to talk more about. So of these estates, as we've been discussing them, I said one of the biggest testable pieces is whether or not it is inheritable. Well, of course, only ownership estates can be inherited. Okay. We didn't even get into the leasehold estates yet. But those obviously cannot be inherited That's because it's not ownership, okay? That's it's a completely different concept. But of these freehold estates, we break them into estates of inheritance versus estates not of inheritance. And so I just kind of told you which ones were and which ones were not. So here's where I basically took that same kind of chart and I recategorized it based on inheritance versus not of inheritance. So you still look like you're taking notes, so I'll give you a second before I swap this. Bam. So same list, but I've regrouped them. And what I want you to see here is that every single freehold estate is potentially an estate of inheritance, except for a conventional life estate. That is the only one that is never inheritable. Never, ever, ever. Because you only own it so long as you are alive. The second you die, it's not yours to own anymore. And the reason why the life estate per ultra V, which is for the life of another, says sometimes inheritable, it's only inheritable if the life tenant dies before the measuring life. So it doesn't mean it's always inheritable. It's not necessarily always inheritable. Because if the life tenant is alive, but then the measuring life dies, they they can't, they don't own it anymore. So basically every single freehold estate is an, an estate of inheritance except for a conventional life estate. And it never can be, never will be. Period. So I've already kind of mentioned all of these different notes that are going to come up in just a second. And of course, I'll slow down more when we get into a deeper dive just to help you, you know, stick these in your brain where they belong. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, you can never give a greater ownership than you currently have. If you own the property fee simple to feasible, you could sell it, you could will it, you could do all these things, but the next person would still have it as a type of defeasible. Whether that be determinable or subject to a condition subsequent would be dependent on whatever property it was. Same thing with those life estates. Can you sell those life estates? Sure, but they would only own it so long as whoever the measuring life was was still alive. I do want to make a, a point of clarity here. Okay, well, it says the, the grantor can never transfer a better, or stronger level of ownership than what they have themselves. That is extremely true, and I just said that. But here's the point of clarity. You can give somebody a better type of deed than what you have. Just a document. But you cannot give them more ownership than what you had. And you'll see what, that mean, what I mean by that when we get into this a little bit more in the deed section in just a moment. 
So here's where you get the actual individual pieces via the slides, okay? I walked you through it, but here's where you can see it, especially those of you who like to take notes, okay? Fee simple absolute, I told you, highest and best form of ownership. It's the most common form of ownership. If you own a property right now and you were to hunt down your deed, it would say fee simple. I promise it would. 99.9% .9 of people own their properties fee simple. On the test, fee simple, fee, abs fee simple absolute mean the same thing. If you're answering a test question for fee simple or fee simple absolute, answer them the same. They would have to specifically say defeasible or qualified fee if they meant anything other than this. And remember what I told you, this does not necessarily mean no restrictions at all because you still have your private and public land use controls potentially. But folks, understand that those restrictions are not powerful enough to lose you your ownership. Let's go back to Dora's fence. Dora has an HOA that says that she can't have a unique fence. Well, if Dora was to put up a unique fence, her HOA could issue fines. If she doesn't pay those fines, they could put liens on her property. But they can't own her property. They can't take it away from her. There are restrictions, but they're not powerful enough to remove her from her ownership. So don't ever think that like, you know, fee simple absolute means no restriction. No, just no restrictions strong enough to remove you from your ownership. So there is no restriction on time, no restriction on use. Fee simple absolute. And as I told you, if you're getting anything less than fee simple, it's either limiting the time or it's limiting the use. And that's where these other two came into play, okay? Limiting the use was the two different types of qualified fee, also called defeasible. The two different types were determinable and subject to a condition subsequent. If we wanted to limit your time, it is a life estate. Whether it be conventional, where the life tenant and the measuring life are the same, or a life estate per ultra V, where the life tenant and the measuring life are different people. So here's the two different types of defeasible. Just continuing to break this down. This is all things that we've already seen and talked about. Okay, you've got to keep this straight in your head because remember, defeasible, also called what? Defeated. Well, it sounds like defeated and that's exactly what it is. You can defeat your ownership, but what's the other name for it that you can see it called on the test? Qualified fee. Qualified fee, qualified fee. And so the two different types are fee simple determinable, you have to do this one thing. Or fee simple subject to a condition subsequent, do whatever you want so long as you don't do this one thing. So it would be and that's called fee simple defeasible or fee simple what? Fee, qualified fee. Fee simple defeasible, also called qualified fee. If it was talking about a qualified fee estate, it means the same as fee simple defeasible. It's something where you could lose your ownership. And it's just qualified fee. It's not qualified fee simple or anything like that. No, but, you know, I, I'm not going to swear that they're not going to put any other weird verbiages in there. Um, but they typically just call it qualified fee. Like a qualified fee estate. So here's just some notes as I've been kind of warning you about this. Okay, remember defeasible is the broad category. It's also called qualified fee you will see both of those terms on the test and they help you to remember what they are you have to qualify for your ownership or in other words you could defeat your own ownership
Yeah, I always try to do a good job of warning y'all about the uh, the nuances on the test because they the, the, I've seen the mistakes that students make quite a bit. And so you really try to drill it in your head so you can keep it straight. Um, Jacob, these are all the slides that you opened this morning or this uh, earlier this evening, but I will email them to you uh, as well. But yeah, these these are the ones that I just you just opened. You have all of these uh, when you clicked that link earlier. But I will email. Okay, them. I thought that that I thought that that was um, the ones from last week. No, these are. I mean, there's over 266 slides, so. You know, the only other ones we got into last week were some of the ones on the Relink book. They're not as important for you to have because that Relink book is changing this week anyway. Uh, but yeah, this is this is the same ones we started in last week and they're still working into this week. Yep. Okay, so these are the slides for like the rest of the course? No. No, but at least like the next five units. Okay, gotcha. Yep. This will, these will go all the way up until agency and then we have different slides for agency. So I gave you the example earlier, and so here's just reiterating it again. I used Monica as the example, and in this one it's Mark, okay? Grantor sets one allowable use for subsequent owners. Uh, that is fee simple determinable. So if Mark grants ownership of a property to Susan as long as she only ever uses it as a horse farm, that would be fee simple determinable. We have determined the one allowable use. And so this is where the actions of the grantee could terminate, defeat, or whatever their ownership. If you stop doing the one thing, remember the determinable for whatever reason is automatic reversion. The second that Susan stops using it as a horse farm, she doesn't own it anymore. Automatically reverts back to the grantor or the grantor's heirs. So here's those notes again. Termination is automatic, reverts back, and then some of the verbiage that you could see associated with this, as long as you only ever use it as a horse farm, until you stop using it as a horse farm, during the time you use it as a horse farm, while you use it, right? There's a lot of verbiage associated with this. that just kind of comes into play. As long as you are doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing, you're good. The other side of defeasible, right? That is the fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Do whatever you want so long as you don't do whatever. Okay, blank. So Thomas purchases a property that allows him to do whatever he wants except sell alcohol on the property. If he can do anything except this one thing that is fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. So here's some supplemental notes with this one. This is where you must not do that specific thing. Remember I said termination is not automatic on this one. You would have to regain ownership by going to court. And so this is where some of the verbiage you may see, everything except, right? Think, but if you do this one thing, provided that you don't do this one thing, on the condition that you don't do this one thing, how are we feeling out there in La La Land, folks? Everybody doing okay so far? <laughs> sure, why not, Corey? Yep, ready to make flashcards. Yeah, there you go. Corey made that funny face. Corey's like, oh, I'm good. And he gave me the thumbs up. And he's like, uh, maybe. That's a lot. A lot of verbiage, folks. Uh, please understand that, that I mean... Hate to say it, we're just scratching the surface. Remember when I told you that it's like drinking from three fire hoses simultaneously? I mean, it really is. And this stuff's not even incredibly testable. And think about the extent that, like, which I'm like explaining it to you. Uh, just wait till we get to financing, okay? Financing and agency. That's where we. That's where we separate the uh, the men from the boys, okay? The women from the girls, as they say. That's where we'll we'll really see how you can handle these things. Let me put the next slide up for those of you who want to just get an, uh, an up and head look at it. Uh, but uh, go take a break. You've earned it. So we are talking about 
different estates. And so I've already introduced these words to you. Reversion and remainder. Okay, reversion is where ownership reverts back to the grantor or the grantor's heirs. And it exists in a couple different types of ownership or a couple different types of estates. But the most common testable aspect of it is, of course, uh, these life estates. Okay, these life estates either having this reversionary interest or remainder interest. So a remainder is where we name a third party for it to go to. When this wipes out, when this ends, when this whatever, it will go to this person. <coughs> okay. Now, if we do not distinguish, if we do not tell you, it defaults to reversion. So it's just very important to understand default. So if I say, I give Adriana a life estate so long as Adriana is alive, and I tell you nothing else, when Adriana dies, where is it going? There's an unmute button. Reverts to the grantor? Yeah, reverts to the grantor. Everybody's like, and I'm like, I need to know that you actually know what happens. That you can't just make, this is not a test answer, right? This this little, it's not a test Sorry. answer. All good. Um, yeah, it goes back to the grantor. If I don't give you any additional information, it goes back to the grantor. Now, if I said, you know, Adriana owns this so long as uh, she's alive, and upon her death, it will go to... Uh, Minoj, right? Now that's a uh, remainder interest, right? Monica, you got a question? Oh, you unmuted yourself. Uh, I thought you just said not to give waiting answers. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you can stay muted. I just, you know, I, I need at least one person to unmute at me and, uh, and give me the answer. Because okay. if I can read your lips, it's one thing. But, like, I can't read wavy answers. That's all I was saying. I, I knew we all knew what it was. I was just picking on y'all because I have to hear somebody say it out loud. You are all good. So the life estates, I told you the, the big categories that we got to break these into is this conventional life estate versus the life estate per ultra V. Kirsten, you look so disappointed. Were you, you still need those slides? You still need that? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I, I, I can read the visual cues, folks. I, I can see all of you in one fell swoop. So I'm like, I just broke Kirsten's heart. She just was disappointed. She's like, nope, dead to me, Seth. Now, and I will remind you too, folks, and I'm not trying to pick on any of you. I will warn you that as we get into this, you know, more and more, there are going to be times where you do not get to take all the notes that you want to take. And I'm apologizing in advance for that, but that's why I give you the copies of the slides. It's just, you know, in the beginning, I find that I have to take this kind of slow because this is all kind of a new thought process change to y'all. And so I need you to have time to like grasp these things. But as we keep going, I have to speed up and speed up and speed up because if I don't, we will not get through everything, you know. I, I have taught this class uh, many different ways, and I'll tell you right now, even 90 hours is not enough to go over everything to the level I need to go over it. And so we're 80 hours, including the tests. So, um, Misty, I put them in the chat earlier. Let me see if I still have them saved. I think hopefully that's the link right there. I just pasted whatever the link was earlier, so that might be them. Yeah. <clears throat> so, these life estates I told you, the big category is conventional life estate and life estate per ultra V. Okay, a conventional life estate is never willable because you own it so long as you are alive. So you are the life tenant, you are the measuring life, they're the same person in a conventional life estate. You own it so long as you're alive, they own it so long as they're alive, whoever it may be. And yet again, this could be with remainder or reversion, where it goes to some third party that's been named strategically, or if it's not been named, it would go back to the grantor or the grantor's heirs. Life estate per ultra V could potentially be willable because you own it so long as this other person is alive for the life of another. So the life tenant and the measuring life are different people. Folks, please understand that the life tenant and the measuring life 
do not need to be related in any way, shape, and form. I could say, DeJay, you own this so long as Jim Carrey is alive. Jim Carrey doesn't even have to know that he's the measuring life, okay? There's no rule that you states you have to tell this person. You can create it any which way you want. You own this so long as this person is alive. Now, in that scenario, though, folks, think about this. I said, DeJay, you own this so long as Jim Carrey is alive. Does Jim Carrey have any ownership interest in that property? No. He's a unit of measure. That's it. And there's nothing stating that he'll ever own it. He is just a unit of measure. You see that, that important distinguishing factor. The measuring life, in theory, could end up having some ownership interest if it was willed to them or something like a kid. But it could also be somebody completely obscure that will never have an ownership interest. Everybody good with that statement? Um, the, the second statement right here um, that says for the life of another, is that just a reiteration of the third bullet point? Um, it, it's just the translation of Pearl Trevi. Pearl Trevi quite literally translates to for the life of another. Okay. Yeah. So the clarification is that the life tenant and the measuring life are different people in a life estate per ultra V. On a side note, I'm just thankful that I don't have all this sinus pressure teaching agency because that'd be even worse. I mean, this is hard enough, but I'm like, I don't even think it's like possible to have like this much sinus pressure on a head. It should be a criminal thing. Uh, so I've already said this time and time and time again. These are just reiterating the slides for maximum retention. Okay. The terminologies that you need to understand are life tenant, the person who owns it. Do not let that word tenant confuse you. They are an owner, but they will not own it forever because the time of their ownership has been restricted. They only own it for as long as the measuring life is alive. Whether that be them or somebody else is the differentiating factor on whether it's a conventional life state or a life state pro to be. So this life estate they are the owner, and they can do everything an owner could do. Now, within reason, they can sell it, they can live in it, they can occupy it, they can rent it. Basically, what it comes down to is they can do whatever they want, except they can't do anything to destroy the property eventually going to somebody else. So they would not be allowed to just burn the property down. They would not be allowed to dissect it piece by piece and sell it for lumber. They would not be, you know, whatever that looks like for the property. They're not allowed to destroy the potential future benefit of another. That's what they're not allowed to do. And so I think there's a slide for this, if I'm not mistaken, but I'm just going to throw it in here just because it's on my mind. You are allowed to use the resources on the property for the benefit of the property. So let's say that you own it and there's like timberland. In theory, you could cut the timberland to help pay for the property, the taxes, improvements on the property or something like that. You cannot cut it to make a profit. Okay, so there is limitations on what you can do to, you know, because of the fact that it's going to go to somebody else. The use of the resources on the property to help cover the cost of the property is called estovers. I'll put that in the chat. Estovers. No, one of those random terminology words. So we've got the life tenant and we've got the measuring life. And so the life tenant and the measuring life can be the same person, conventional life estate, or the life tenant and the measuring life could be different people, life estate per ultra V. Regardless, when the measuring life dies, the ownership of that life tenant also dies. That's how this works. And as I told you before, we're not just going to let this property ownership sit in limbo. Something's got to happen to this ownership because the dead person can't own it. 
And so we either set it up with remainder or reversion. So it will either revert or go to a named remainder man. What about somebody who has uh, what was it, full ownership that is called? Fee simple absolute. Um, yeah, be yeah, be simple absolute. What happens when they pass away? Is in that situation, is that where it's just passed down? I mean, if they don't have something specifically listed in their will. Yeah, that that's the whole point of it, right? Fee simple absolute. Um, let's say that you die and you own your property fee simple absolute. You can will it. You could gift it. You could sell it before you die. You could, you know, whatever. That's that's what makes it that, right? There is nothing stating your you have any restrictions. That's why it's called fee simple absolute. Yeah, my question was, what happens if they don't say what's going to happen to the property after they die and they, and they die? And we've already answered that. Now we're going to get into more in, de in detail. So, folks, when you die... Uh, and you die with a will, meaning a last will and testament, which is basically a list of here's what I want to happen with my crap. If you die with a will, and as long as your will can be upheld legally as it goes through probate, your will will be upheld. If you die without a will, most states write one for you. Generically speaking, it is called, when you die without a will, it's called dying intestate. Okay, intestate. And so what kicks in is the law of intestate succession. So, Jacob, you own $6 billion worth of real estate because you really played your cards right, but you never got married, you don't have any kids, and you die without a will. So now this $6 billion worth of real estate, whatever state you're living in, is going to write a will for you. They're going to say, okay, we're going to give it to Jacob's kids. He didn't have kids, give it to Jacob's parents. He didn't have parents, give it to his siblings. He didn't have siblings. And if they go down however many tiers are in the respective state, that's where a cheat comes in. They will try to give it to your next heirs and assigns. And if you don't have nobody and you didn't have a will, the government will take it. The state will take it. Yeah. There you go. So that's why it's important to have a will, because otherwise the government's going to get your stuff. So we keep talking about this remainder man versus a reversionary interest. I think y'all were getting this now. I also told you that there's this differentiation between freehold versus non-freehold. You've seen this all before. You know, please don't uh, panic here in any way, shape, and form. Freehold is ownership. Non-freehold, also called leasehold, are estates not of ownership. They're estates of leases. Because you do have an interest in a property when you're leasing it. Two years left on your lease, you got a relationship to this property, at least for another two years. One year left, you got a relationship, at least for another couple years. Now, I'm going to briefly mention this, just so we can get it out of the way, but it does have its own section later, Okay. And then we'll circle back around to some of the other examples of the, the freehold estates. So in a leasehold estate, there are four. Four testable leasehold estates. And so these relationships are between, and you always got to be thinking about the parties to something, okay? Landlord and tenant. Property owner and the person renting it. Lessor, lessee. However you want to articulate it. And so for these leasehold estates, here's the real quick mention. Please don't panic. I told you this has a later section. We will talk about it a little bit more in depth in the uh, property management section, I believe it is. So here is the four. And I'm just going to give you the most straightforward definition because this is not the section that I'm actually teaching it in. But I just don't want you to forget that leasehold is a thing. Leasehold estates are your estate for years, also called an estate from year to year. Those are the same thing. Estate for years, also called an estate from year to year. There is a periodic tenancy, there is an estate at will, and there is an estate at sufferance. Now folks, there is not a single thing that is going to be on any of the slides about these yet. I've got this coming later, but here's what you have to understand. These can be very misleading. There are a lot of real estate concepts in this course where it is not even remotely what it sounds like. Let me show you what I mean. If I ask you to take a guess 
what an estate for years was. What would you tell me? A place you're renting for years. And that would be the most common guess that I get. That's exactly right. And it's not that at all. Okay, so let me explain an estate for years. It sounds like it would be some type of leasing for a long period of time. It's not. The thing that makes these unique is how the lease ends, how the relationship ends. An estate for years is a lease that has a very specific start date and end date. So in other words, I'll give you two examples. A commercial lease is this typically an estate for years. Like a 10 year lease would be an estate for years. Why? Because it starts on this date and it ends exactly on this date 10 years from now. No wiggle room, start date, end date. But here's why an estate for years should not be thought of as just a long-term lease. Folks, if you rent a beach house for a week, it is an estate for years. You check in on a certain date, get the hell out on a certain date, right? So the big differentiation between an estate for years, which has a very specific start date and end date, and a periodic tenancy, is a periodic tenancy automatically renews. When you are doing a residential lease in North Carolina, you are doing a periodic tenancy because what happens, right? You typically sign a one-year lease. Folks, what happens at the end of your year in North Carolina when you're renting an apartment, a house, or whatever? Well, you're given the option to renew, but what Adam, yeah. Yeah. More specifically, you're given the option to not renew. So what these leases state in North Carolina, because all residential leases in North Carolina are required to be periodic tenancies. So what they'll basically say is they will automatically renew unless you give notice of your intent to not renew 30 days, 60 days or whatever prior to the end of that lease term. That's the big difference. Estate for years, when it's done, it's done. Periodic tenancy, if you didn't give notice of your intent to not renew, it will renew. And it could be renewing for a subsequent year, could be return, renewing for month to month, whatever it, it looks like, it's renewing. That's the big differentiation between the two. I'm sorry, Sam, was that you just had your hand up? Where'd you go? No? Who? Oh, Adriana, maybe? Who? You respond to my question before I... Oh, okay, ask. yeah. That was good. Thanks. I'm good at that, yeah, for sure. Could you quickly just repay the state at will? I, I haven't said it yet. I'm sorry. Okay. No, 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 you're fine. So a state for years, start date, end date, very distinct. Okay. When it starts, it starts. When it ends, it ends. That's an estate for years. Periodic tenancy. If you don't give notice, it will automatically renew for some subsequent term. On a state at will. You ready for this? It's super complicated. With permission. That's it. On a state at will is with permission. A, let me give you an example of this. Uh, one of my best friends went through a divorce a few years back. And so in the midst of his divorce, he needed a place to stay while his divorce was going through and before he could buy his own house. So I looked at him and I said, hey man, you can come stay with me as long as you need to. That's an estate at will. There was no time, there was no money, but there was permission. So an estate at will does not have a period of time Typically not associated with any money. You're just here with permission. Stay here until you get back on your feet. Stay here until you find a place. Stay here as long as you like. These are all called a state at wills. You have been given permission to occupy somebody else's dwelling. No time, no money discussed. That's it. And an estate at sufferance is a unique concept because typically... It's an estate that started one of these other three ways, but it's no longer on good terms anymore. So let's say your vacation rental, the estate for years, it was for a week. You're supposed to check out at 11 o'clock the, uh, the last day. You didn't, you're still there at four o'clock that afternoon. That's an estate at sufferance. You've gone past your time. Let's use my buddy as the example. It was the estate at will. I said, stay here as long as you like. And he stays a little too long. I said, dude, it's been too long. Get the hell out. He refuses to leave. That's an estate at sufferance. An estate at sufferance, typically somebody who gains access by way of one of these legal uh, estates, okay? But then they overstay their welcome, an, a holdover tenant, if you will. 
I asked them to leave, their time was up, whatever it may be, and they didn't go. That's in a state of sufferance. Now, I just wanted to mention these because they are technically estates, and so I didn't want you to like get them lost in and not group them here because you could, you know, like for test purposes, you want to group them all kind of in a similar vein. But the, we talk about these more in the property management section, the, the landlord tenant relationship section. So you'll, we'll get more detail on it, but that, there's all of them in a nutshell. And they really are that straightforward. <clears throat> so, the last two honorable mentions, before we delve just a little bit deeper uh, in the time we have left into some other concepts, is what we call a marital life estate and a homestead. You, you could potentially see these, not a crazy level. Um, so let's talk about it. A marital life estate is basically a legal premise that you cannot disinherit your spouse. And so if you're not aware of this, when you get married, you have these vows and you say some things like what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine and all this crap, okay? Uh, and so let's say that you get married and you own some stuff and you either don't like your spouse that much or you never changed your will after you got married. And so you die and your spouse survives you. But on your will, you left nothing to your spouse. You can't do that. Okay, You're not legally allowed to disinherit your spouse. That's what a marital life estate is. They automatically get something because you are married to them. Now, certain states have certain laws and rules and the way that it kind of goes. And it's not everything and it's not half. Typically, what they will utilize is what's called a length of marriage approach, where they basically say, okay, well, how long were you married? What did you have? What percentage of this do we think that you have a right to? That's called a marital life estate. You cannot disinherit your spouse. You are legally allowed to disinherit your kids, but your spouse, you cannot. And then the homestead, you know, there's a couple times that homestead kind of gets thrown around. Of course, everybody nowadays is like, oh, you mean like pickling and canning and like having some chickens and growing. No, it's not like that. It's basically a homestead exemption uh, from a, you know, people going after your interest kind of thing. It's basically protections for the place that you call your your home from creditors kicking you out on the streets. They, they would not be allowed to go after that as their first asset if you were owed money because of certain homestead protections. That's just an honorable mention in the, uh, the estates sec uh, section, if you will. No. Well, really quickly, um, the textbook says that um for the homestead, there's like um, certain liens can't be up there. They cannot be exempt, like a mortgage lien or a tax lien, um, or even for improvements. Um, so I guess like, is there any special circumstance that this would be applicable to before? Uh, yeah, what th this just means for like generic creditors and the reason, and it's going to make more sense when we get into it, Josh. So what Josh is saying is it says that it's not applicable to, um, you know, mortgage liens. And that's because that's exactly how mortgage liens works. They attach to a piece of property as a specific lien and they have the right to take that property so that it doesn't protect you from that because that's a legal agreement that you've already gone into. What this would basically say is that American Express, you know, third party creditors have nothing to do with real estate, can't go after and force you to sell your house and live on the streets to pay, you know, an unsatisfied credit card debt or a lawsuit, right? Like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, you know, they would not necessarily, yeah, I went there. They wouldn't necessarily force Amber Heard to sell her house and live on the streets to pay Johnny his money because of these homestead protections. You know, that's what that gets into. But because specific liens have to deal with that house, they're, they're not exempt. They, they can go after your property. Well, uh, what about medical? Because I didn't see medical. Or I could have opened. Uh, no medical. Uh, well, no. See how, as like the insurance company always asks, like, what 
um, assets do you have? Do you have a home? How many vehicles do you have? You know, and things like that. So. Yeah, no, typically medical can't. And in fact, uh, you know, I don't know if y'all saw that uh, medical debt isn't even allowed to be under credit report anymore. They changed that. Uh, There's some legislation passed. So if you had any medical debt on your credit report, you can get it expunged. Uh, they can still go after you for it, but uh, it's not allowed to be under credit report anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting side note. So let me just give you a few more examples to help you understand, you know, these different estates. And if you're feeling good, then we'll move on. I've got some other slides I can throw in later to help us review this. But <clears throat> I just want to make sure that you're comfortable with um, these life estates just because you could get some questions on them. Okay, so if I was to say that, um, who do I want to pick on? Misty, if Misty owns a home, so long as Misty is alive, what type of life estate is that, folks? Conventional. A conventional life estate. Now, if Misty put in her will that upon her death, she wanted to leave that property to her firstborn child, what will happen when she dies? It won't go to her firstborn child. It will not go to her firstborn child. And since I've given you no information, who is it going to go to when she dies? <clears throat> to the grand, the grantor. The grantor. Whoever gave it to Misty, and if they're dead, it will be the grantor's heirs. That's exactly right. If I said that um, Kirsten owns a property so long as Kingsley is alive, what type of life estate is this? Life estate per Ultra V. Life estate per Ultra V, right? Because Kirsten is a life tenant, Kingsley is the measuring life. And so let's say Kirsten dies and in her will, she wills it to Jacob. Who will own the property upon Kirsten's death? Wait, say that again. Kirsten dies and leaves a will trying to will this property to Jacob. Who will own the property when Kirsten dies? And Kirsten was the measuring life? Kirsten was the life tenant. Jacob? Okay. Who was so the measuring life? As long as Kingsley is alive, Jacob would. There you go. So Kirsten was the life tenant. Kingsley was the measuring life. And so Kirsten died... The measuring life was still alive, so it's still Kirsten's to own. Kirsten willed it to Jacob. Jacob Jacob will be the new owner. Now, how long will Jacob own it for? As long as Kingsley's alive. Until Kingsley, then, dies. Until Kingsley dies. There you go. And so then if we say, you know, uh, something like uh, Tim owns the property so long as Tim's alive. And upon Tim's death, Justin will get the property. Well, is that a reversionary interest or a remainder interest? Remainder. Remainder, because I've named Justin as a third party. Now, here's the thing you have to understand, folks. Uh, who, who did I just use? Was it Tim? Was Tim my measuring? Okay, it, it all gets jumbled, doesn't it? Yeah. Tim was the, okay. So Tim owns it so long as Tim's alive, and if Tim dies, then it goes to Justin. Now, here's the thing, though. While Tim's alive, does Justin own that property in any way, shape, and form? No. No. But isn't there a pretty sure chance that Justin will ultimately own that property if he's named as the remainder man? Yes. Yes. So we call that an estate and remainder. So remember that word estate is what level of legal interest you have. Justin has an estate and remainder. He does not own it right now, but once somebody kicks the bucket, he will own it. It's called an estate and remainder. If I was the grantor of the property and I gave it to Tim and it did not have a remainder interest, Tim owns it. I don't anymore, even though I'm the one that gave it to him. But if it has a reversionary interest, I'm said to have an estate in reversion. If you are set to potentially get it at some point, you do have an interest in it. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. But in the life estate Pearl Trevi, 
that measuring life doesn't have an estate in anything because they're not potentially ever going to have an ownership interest in the property. They are just a unit of measure. But reversionary and remainder, you are said to have an estate in reversion or an estate in remainder. Even though you don't own it yet, you'll potentially get that ownership back or get that ownership in general. Everybody good with those comments? Yeah, I think so. Cool. <clears throat> it's a lot. I get it. But, I mean, this is stuff like you just got to hear it over and over again, right? I mean, I remember teaching this for the first time and I'm like, this, really? This is what I have to teach? This is some malarkey, right? Ain't no reason that we need to go into this level of anything for these poor people. Uh, but they test you on it. And so, to me, I like this these conversations. They're just like, they're just so commonplace for me now. But, of course, I've been doing this for years and years and years. You know, to you folks, it's like, this guy's speaking a different language. He's making crap. I'm, he's making this up. I've never heard this before in my life. I promise I'm not making it up. But it is kind of a, a harder thought process, which is why a lot of people don't like this section. So let's scratch the surface on kind of a sister thought process. It's not the same. Everybody has a tendency to group them together because we teach them back to back. So everything we were just talking about was estates. Okay, what level of interest you have in a property, relationship or otherwise. The next section is dealing in what we call uh, ownership. Yeah, estates were all different things, um, you know, some ownership, some not. But what I mean is, well, who owns it? So we talked about how you own it, but now we want to talk about who owns it. And so understand that ownership can be one of two things. We can have what we call ownership in severalty. Remember, we used a similar word to this earlier when we talked about annexation and severance. To sever something is to remove it from something. And so in this same context, severalty is by itself. So if I say you own the property in severalty, you're the sole owner. Don't think several as in many. Think you're over there by yourself, severed off, by yourself, okay? So ownership and severalty is one owner, whether it be a person or an entity. Microsoft owning a property, that's ownership and severalty. Uh, Tim owning a property, that's ownership and severalty. Corey owning a property, that's ownership and severalty. One owner is called ownership and severalty. And it is, it's fantastic, folks, because one person makes the decisions. One person decides to sell, one person decides what they're gonna do with it, one person has to sign the paperwork. It's, it's clean, it's neat, it's nice. We love ownership and severalty. But of course, we all understand that there are times that we have multiple owners on pieces of property. And we call that concurrent ownership. When there is more than one owner, it's called concurrent ownership. We got three broad categories of concurrent ownership, meaning multiple owners, and they all act a little bit different. So as you can see here, we've got tenancy in common, joint tenancy, and tenancy by the entirety. Now, the reason we have to have some in-depth conversations about this, number one, is because it's testable. But number two, there is a really big set of questions that we have to answer when we start talking about concurrent ownership. And I think you'll agree with me when you see some of these questions that they are very important to know the answer to from a real estate point of view. Um, Sam says, is concurrent ownership also called joint ownership? Yes, it can be. Just be very careful that, you know, you're not reading joint tenancy and thinking that it's the same thing. Joint tenancy is a type of, and so if you say joint ownership, it is just saying multiple owners, but that is different than joint tenancy specifically. So just be careful with the context. So here's the questions we have to answer. Now I'm gonna do exactly like I did before, okay? I'm gonna show you these questions and then I'm gonna come back to this and I'm just gonna explain them all and then I'll give you the more in-depth version, okay? Here's why we have to talk about this in great detail. Can we all agree that if we've got multiple owners on a piece of property, we need to know things like who can use the property at any given time? Do we all own the same amount 
And do we all have to agree to sell it? These are very important questions to understand if you own property with somebody. Whether they be your spouse, your friend, a family member, doesn't matter. You need to know the answers to these questions. So I'm going to go back to this chart and I'm just going to walk you through them. And then I'm going to give you the in-depth version. Tenancy in common, as the name implies, is the most common type of concurrent ownership. Tenancy in common, here's the important piece, is for anyone. If I wanted to right now, I could rally us all together, have us all chip in some money, and we could all go buy a beach house together. And we could own that beach house in equal 18 divided shares, okay? We each own one eighteenth, and we can own it as tenants in common. We are all owners. We are all equal owners. doesn't have to be equal, but in this case it is. And so that's one of the neat things about tenancy in common is it's for anybody. And so here's the cool thing about tenancy in common, okay? This is the one that makes the most sense for most people. Why? Because if all of us own one eighteenth of this beach house that we just chipped in and bought together, if Sandeep dies, he can leave his one eighteenth share to his kids. If Misty dies, she can leave her one eighteenth to her heirs and assigns. If Sam dies, same thing. If I die, same thing. If Stephanie dies, same thing. And so tenancy in common, your share is willable. As you've kind of figured out, a lot of these estates and concurrent and ownership questions, the test, they're going to ask about whether you can will it, what you can do with it, what you can't do with it. That's how all these questions are going to go. So tenancy in common doesn't have to be equal shares. It's just multiple owners. If somebody dies, they can will their share. They can sell their share. They can do whatever they want. Joint tenancy, yet again, is for anybody. If we elected to, when we bought that beach house, instead of buying it as tenants in common, we could all look at each other and say, okay, well, let's just do it as joint tenants. And so, yet again, we would all own one eighteenth of the property. But here's the big kicker. Joint tenancy is... I'm going to say typically, but go ahead and for all intents and purposes, think always. It's accompanied by what we call a right of survivorship. Which means that if we are all joint tenants on a piece of property and one of us dies, you can't will your share anymore. Because what happens is the other joint tenants absorb your share. And so let's say that we all bought this property together, this beach house, and I died. Well, now instead of you all owning 1 18th, you would all own 1 17th. And then Adriana died. You would now all would own 1 16th. And you see your portions get bigger and bigger every time as you somebody dies and you just absorb their share. And so in theory... If this was like the Predator movie where we're just getting picked off one by one, whoever was still standing at the end would own 100% of the property. So you can, of course, see why a lot of people wouldn't elect to do that. Why on God's green earth would we as semi-acquaintances for only a couple weeks now want to buy a property where our ownership would get absorbed by everybody else? But just because it doesn't make sense for us doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. And so then the last one, ten, and please understand, I'm going to give you a lot of examples. I'm just giving you the blanketed knowledge here. Tenancy by the entirety is the last one, and only married couples can have tenancy by the entirety. Okay, it's for married couples only. Does it contain a right of survivorship? You have to be married at the time you take title. So I'm going to dive into these a little bit more, but that's it in a nutshell, okay? Tenancy in common is for anybody, but you can will your shares. Joint tenancy is for anybody, but you can't will your shares because somebody else will absorb it when you kick the bucket. 
And then tenancy by the entirety, you can't will your shares um, and you have to be married couples only because of this, this thing called this right of survivorship. So let's give you some examples here to help you understand this, okay? Tenancy in common does not have to be equal. And so remember that property in Georgia that I told you about. I like to use it as an example here. Uh, folks, the property I have in Georgia, uh, I inherited one-eighth of it uh, when my grandmother passed away. There was me, my two brothers, and five cousins. There was eight of us total. So I inherited one-eighth of this piece of property. And I turned around and I bought everybody out on that property except for my two brothers. My two brothers, I let them keep their ownership interest. So now I own six eighths of the property in Georgia and they each own one eighth or 12.5% because they own a quarter together. I own 75% if you're good with numbers. Now here's the thing, folks. Can we all agree that I own most of that property? Yes. Well, when we talk about these ownerships, okay, tenancy in common, joint tenancy, doesn't matter. We always say that each owner holds an undivided interest in severalty, which seems weird to say because it's not ownership in severalty, but you do own your portion, right? Your percentage uniquely. But what do you think I mean when I say undivided? What does that mean? Undivided. I know it doesn't have to be equal. I know it doesn't have to be equal. Doesn't have to be equal. Ah, uh, what does that mean? I wrote it. What were you saying, Misty? That you couldn't be separated. They couldn't, like your brothers couldn't be separated from their ownership of the property. No, it's not they that. Be divided from there. Like it, you couldn't take more of their rights away. It's it's theirs. And well, and that is true. I can't like take more of their rights away, but that's not quite what it means. Okay. They have the same rights? What do you mean? Mm. So, Identi you identical rights? Is that right? Yeah. Folks, let's talk about this. I own 75% of that property. But I can't walk in there with a highlighter and be like, you can only use 25%, this 25% of the toilet. You can only use 25% of this walkway. You can only use one. I can't go in there and tell them which part of it they can and can't use. Even though I am the majority owner of that property, they are also owners. That's what we mean by undivided. They can come and go as they please in every way, shape, and form. This is the danger of owning property with other people. They are also owners. The only reason why this number matters is because if we sell it, I get 75% of the profits, they get 12.5% each. When the tax bill comes, I'm responsible for 75% of it, they're responsible for 12.5% each. The only reason that number matters is for finances. It is an undivided interest. We are all owners. We can all use it. And so if one of my brothers who only owns 12.5% moved into that house tomorrow and refused to leave, there is nothing I could do about it because they are an owner. So you gotta be very careful when you own property with other people because if they don't have the same outlook on it, the same goals, the same whatever, you can end up being shafted. Now, of course, you can always set rules and restrictions from a legal point of view at the time of its inception, but without agreement to the contrary, they're all owners and it is what it is. If I wanted to sell it, I would need their permission. If they wanted to sell it, they would need my permission. We, we have to make these decisions together because we're all owners. Now, that being said, this is all willable. So my brother owns one eighth. He has two kids. If he dies and he wanted to leave his one eighth to his two kids, they would each now own one sixteenth. That is one eighth divided by two. So they're never gonna own more than one eighth total, but because more people came into the mix, it's a smaller piece of the pie. You can will your share in tenants in common.
you can sell it too. Don't get confused on that. Now, understand what that would look like, right? Imagine my brother walking up to any of y'all. Hey, would y'all like to buy one-eighth of an interest in a random piece of property in Georgia that my brothers also own? And, you know, most of us probably don't want one-eighth of anything with a stranger. So it's not very sellable, but it, you can sell it. Now, interesting side note, I actually have a restriction on it where they're not allowed to sell it without my permission to. They have to offer to sell it to me first. And we'll talk about that later in the contract section. But that just makes good sense. It's called a right of first refusal. So tenancy in common for anybody. Doesn't have to be equal interest. Can be willed, can be sold, can be all these different things. Joint tenancy, yet again, for everybody, okay? You do not have to have a special relationship. That's what I told you. Every single one of us in this room could buy a house as joint tenants. But the problem with joint tenancy is it has that right of survivorship. Now, interesting note, if you're reading any joint tenancy questions, because this is a national concept. If you're reading any joint tenancy questions, always put right of survivorship in there on the national portion. The side note is in North Carolina... We don't just take it at face value that that right of survivorship's in there. So when we draft up a deed with joint tenants, we actually put in specific verbiage that says with right of survivorship. In other states, they just say joint tenants and, and it's, it's, it's known that that right of survivorship is there. North Carolina, we actually put that verbiage in there with right of survivorship. Now, one of the unique things about joint tenancy is it has to have what we call unity of time title, possession, and interest. Time, title, possession, and interest. Now, there's a lot of different resources out there that you could be watching videos on, and so there's two different ways that you could be told to remember this. Some resources use to tip, like T, T-I-P, which is just this backwards. I use PITT, P-I-T-T. Unity of possession, interest, time, and title. And so what that means is, in that example where we all go buy a beach house together, we buy it at the exact same time, we, interest is deeded to us at the same time, okay, we take title at the same time, that's all this means. We did it all at the same time. It is impossible to be a joint tenant if you're not part of the initial formation of it. So let me explain why this is significant. A joint tenant can sell their share. And so if all 18 of us buy a beach house together and we're all a 1 18th tenant, uh, joint tenant and Josh decides to sell his share to his brother who none of us have ever met a couple years after we all bought this beach house together, Josh's brother would come in as a tenant in common. He cannot come in as a joint tenant because he lacks that unity of time, title, and possession and interest. He did not take title at the same time as the rest of us. So he cannot be part of that arrangement. So if you sell your share of a joint tenancy interest, the next person comes in as a tenant in common. Sam, I'm sorry, I just saw your question. Sam's question a few minutes ago was, so what would be the benefit of being the majority owner? Um, in, in my case, Sam, uh, I ultimately plan on kicking my brothers off of it. So I, now I only have to buy like a little bit more. So eventually I, they will all be gone off of it uh, for me, um, you know. Yeah, and I figured that's that's what it was um, that you know, but just to provide that additional clarity because, you know, what you got, Misty? I'm not sure because for some reason in my head, and it may be from when I did real estate previously, I remember joint tenancy as in don't pass a joint to your kids. It's not. It doesn't have survivorship. Is that correct? Why am I remembering that? So it was a... Everybody's looking at you like you're crazy, Misty. Let me clarify. 
it, 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 it was a learning euphemism, acronym, whatever you want to call it. And so because you can't will this to your kids, the way that you remember this is you wouldn't pass a joint to your kids. And just like you wouldn't pass a joint to your kids, you cannot pass your joint tenancy interest to your kids. It's not willable because of this right of survivorship. Okay. Right of survivorship means when you die, the other joint tenants absorb your share. So share. there you go. And so let me show you why this is testable or how this is testable. We all own this beach house as 1 18th joint tenants. Okay. Every single one of us with right of survivorship. Misty has a will that says she wants to leave her 1 18th share to her kids when she dies. When she dies, that will be ignored in probate because it was not hers to leave. So just like she would not pass a joint to her kids, she cannot pass her joint tenancy interest to her kids because the rest of us absorbed her share and we just became 1 17th owners each. There you go. Yes, that's exactly how I remember it. There you go. Um, there you go, Monica. I was, I, for whatever reason, I could not think of that word. I'm like, blah, 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 blah. the mnemonic device. That's exactly right. I, I used every other word I could possibly come up with. I just couldn't remember the word mnemonic. Again. I blame the, the sinus fog, right? Like, I'm like, oh, yeah, mnemonic. Yeah, that's what it does. Don't pass a joint to your kids, just like joint tendency doesn't pass to your kids. So... I'll put the last uh, slide that we'll see today up, and this is where I just said, okay? Because this requires this unity of time, title, possession, and interest. If you were to sell your share in your life to somebody else, you legally can. Now, could you have an agreement that says you can't? Sure. But typically, you legally can. And anybody who comes in would be a tenant in common. So I want you to understand what that means. Let's go back to the scenario where I said we all own this as joint tenants. And Josh sells his 118th to his brother. His brother would be a tenant in common. And so as we all start dying and absorbing each other's shares, Josh's brother's 118th will never change because he is not part of our agreement. He is sitting on his own little island as a 118th tenant in common. So let's say that everybody dies except for Kirsten. Now, Josh's brother owns 1 18th as a tenant in common, and Kirsten owns 17 18ths as a tenant in common, because you cannot have just one joint tenant. As we all died, and she absorbed our share, and absorbed our share, and absorbed our share, and she was left as an owner with one other tenant in common, you can't just have one joint tenant. So they would both be tenants in common. Now, watch what that means. If Kirsten dies, she could leave her 17, 18, seven, I, hold on, my brain, 17, 18 is that how you say that? Is that right? 17, okay, thank you. God, this fog is just doing me dirty. She could, <laughs> I wish there was a better, why is there 18 of us? Why can't there be five? This would have been so much easier. Her 17, 18 to her kids, kid, right? Her son, she could leave that. And so then he would inherit that. And then Josh's brother could leave his one eighth to somebody as well because they've been turned into tenants in common. And your tenants in common ownership is willable. Your joint tenancy was not because of that right of survivorship. Is this making sense for everybody? Well, that being said, folks, we're going to continue talking about this, uh, you know, tomorrow night. I always like to give you a couple of minutes to ask some questions. So we got four minutes left. So whatever y'all want to talk about for the last four minutes, uh, and then we'll keep going tomorrow. Looks like episode three, episode three, day three is up on YouTube now. It finished uploading. So now the, all of last week is up. And then, you know, as I said, this one will get worked out as time goes on. What do you want to talk about? Oh, I'm sorry, Adriana, what you got? So on this um, situation, when the new owner will come in as a tenant in common uh -huh. rather than um, joint tenant, so um, Kirsten will be a, a tenant in common as well? 
Yeah, because you cannot have just one joint tenant. Okay. Yeah. And then, so then it will be no survivorship. The, yep. So. In that scenario that I just gave where, you know, Kirsten had 17 eighteenths and Josh's brother had one eighteenth, there is no survivorship anymore because they are both just tenants in common and tenants in common never has survivorship. Okay. Thank you. For sure. So at that point, either one of them could then will. Yep. And, and it would go to their heirs. Yep. Gotcha. There you go. See, this crap's scary, but don't I just make it so easy to understand? I mean, it's not that bad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Be real intimidating if you know it's not explained right, and it's not too bad. Just can't wait till we get to the agency section. That's when we start to really have some fun. Oof, it's good stuff. Uh, any other questions, comments, concerns in the last two minutes? Anything you want to talk about?